Katra, so nice to meet you. Great meeting you too. Thank you for coming over here. I've been looking forward to meeting you for a very long time. And Consider I myself well. a big fan <laughs> and a loyal longtime follower. You're amazing, and your story is uh, is just insane. The <laughs> things that you've been able to do and what you've had to overcome to be this incredible person that you are. So I'm excited to explore it with you. Thank you. <laughs> so the the latest thing that you just did was you conquered these three 200s, right, in a yes. row? Three 200s within 10 weeks. Within 10 weeks. Yep, 650 plus miles uh-huh. of racing. So three... They're not looped, short loop courses. These are mountainous courses. So the Uh first one was Bigfoot 200 in Washington, which was very, very technical around Mount St. Helens, a huge loop, crazy conditions, very, very rugged. Like you were out there. And so you had to make sure that you carried enough gear for 20 miles in between up to 10 hours by yourself. And then the second one was Tahoe 200, which I had done before. And that one, dusty, dirty, Rubicon Trail, lots of climbing, hot, you know, conditions. And this last one was in Moab, and it was 240 miles. And it actually got extended because there was so much snow up in the higher elevations where we were supposed to go at 10.5 that she couldn't send us up there. It would have been up to our crotches. And so 9,000, but we still had, like, a good 7 to 10 miles of snow to deal with. Wow. So Freezing cold, too. <laughs> so, yeah, it ended up being like three or four miles longer or something like yeah, that? Yeah, it ended up being 243 miles. Right. <laughs> so it was actually five because it was 238. <laughs> how much How much time in between these 200s? Uh, they were like less than a month. Right. So. That's unbelievable. So you're constantly, like when you finish, you're recovering, uh-huh. and then you're tapering. So there's no, right. It, there's no in between like really long running. I think I did once or twice a couple of 20 mile long runs, but there was no reason to, it was like 10 miles at tops when I'm going up right. the mountains. But I mean, that's kind for people that are racing ultras all the time. The races are the training, right? It's exactly. like in between you're maintaining or you're tapering, or you're just trying to absorb the fitness that you garnered as a result of the race. Yep. <laughs> I mean, it's just amazing that you... And are you the first woman to do... What's it called? The Triple Crown? Triple Crown. No, but I think of the oldest woman. The old, oldest uh-huh. female. I mean, 53? I'm not... Uh, 53. 53, yeah. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. yeah, so there was... Yeah, there there was no other women in their 50s doing the triple... I right. mean, they started doing it, but not everybody finished. So last year, two women finished, and I believe this year, seven of us, seven females finished. Finished all three. All three of them. Wow. Mm-hmm. So it only started last year. Uh-huh. Well, the Moab... 240 has gotten a lot of press in the last year or so because of Courtney DeWalter, like just crushing everybody. She's insane (laughs) at Tahoe. I don't know what you saw. If she, I haven't been following it that closely. So this year she was in the lead pretty much the whole time at Tahoe. And then she started having stomach problems and only lost the lead within the last 10 miles. So she was racing another guy the whole entire time. Uh So did she end up second then? Yep. And she got the blue, the woman's course record out of of the water. So she was faster than the year before. Yeah, They both broke the course record. So, uh, so it didn't, he was, right. you know, he broke the overall course record and her time uh-huh. was still an overall course it's, record too. It's, what is, what's going on with her? She's, she's just amazing. A I mean, she ran, she is, yeah. she's so sweet too. And I know you look I've at heard her. interviews with her and she's like, Oh, I don't know. I just go and I run. She she's doesn't very, wear you know, a watch. Like, she doesn't have a coach. Yeah. She doesn't, you know, she's just one of those amazing, talented, gifted athletes. And she won Western States this year too, right. as well. So, and she's at this big yard, uh, Big yard, I forget the name of the race this weekend, and she's going to try to like do 300 miles there. So it's uh-huh. a four mile, loop, four and a half mile loop. Every hour on the hour, you start the loop, and you go as far as you can. So, so you do the loop, standing. and then you wait an hour, and then you start no, again. No, you wait to the top of the hour. Right. So, so every hour you run for t- every and top that's of the, the hour. aggregate time. What's that? So it's the aggregate time that yeah. went. Oh wow! So, so it's interesting. So that involves speed in well, a way that most ultras don't. And how are you going to sleep? Right. And how are you going to, like, eat? you have to, like, re- wait in between. And so it'll be interesting to see how well she does. But That's she's, unique. I heard she was going for, like, 300 miles. Uh-huh. So, because a friend of mine, Maggie's doing it, and she's going for 240. So, mm-hmm. 
but it'll unbelievable. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, with the explosion of the sport, you're seeing you know the higher caliber athletes getting into it, and she's she's dominating like no, nobody's business right now, exactly. which is really cool to see. Right. Um, and I think she's she's like still a school teacher. Yep. <laughs> like it's like she should be like somebody should just pay her you know a lot she's of money. Sponsored, for her but to you know do what, like, you know with our sport though there's not, I know you I don't know. make it's like not very many people make money. I mean you make money promoting product, and that's what I'm doing a lot of now since I've been around for so long and right. then I have my book out. So, you know, people pay you to use their products and to promote it if you like it. So, uh-huh. Well, your resume is insane. Like I can't even keep, you've done so many races. It's impossible to, it's not like we can go race by race through this. Like, I mean, all right, let's see uh, over a hundred, hundred milers. Yep. Um, the first U.S. woman to do that. Only mm-hmm. four people have run over 100 miles. No, there's a lot now. Miles. Oh, there is. Okay, so that's way back. outdated. So there's probably like 10 uh-huh. or 12 now. Yeah, there's at least four women now. 250 plus ultras. Yep. Is that correct? <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, what else? Uh, the I've triple crown 200s. <laughs> 260 marathons. Uh, 137 uh, 100 milers. Numerous yep. records. Um, the big thing that you did though was was record you recorded the fastest known time for the the Muir the, Ramble, the right. Muir Ramble, right? Three hundred and ten miles in seven days. And it was actually three hundred twenty four miles. <laughs> right. And you went longer. Did you get yeah. lost or what happened? And it's just a lot of route finding. The people uh-huh. that wrote the guidebook, they haven't been out on that course in ages. They did it in two thousand six. Uh-huh. So after we finished it, I told them because nobody had run it. And they were like, oh, you know, there had been fires in the area. And, and so a lot of the it's not super sections. Well marked. Of, yeah. So we gave her like the beta, like, I'm like, you need to change it on your website or, you know, so if anybody else goes out there. And I actually met another woman doing it when I was out there. She saw a vehicle that said Muir Ramble Route, Dirt Diva, Catra. And so she, her and her partner were driving by because they were going to go camp that night because she uh-huh. was doing so many miles a day. And they pull up and they said, who's doing the Muir Ramble Route? And then I was like, oh, I am. And she was like, really? She goes, I am too. And I said, yeah, I'm running it. I'm going for the fastest time. So did and you run together? No, she wasn't running it. She was oh, walking it. She was from San Francisco and she started where she lived because it starts in San Francisco and you take the ferry to Oakland and that's when you start your journey right. the way he went. And she was just doing like 15 miles a day. Uh-huh. So, and she was a school teacher and just something to do and to talk about in school and she went back. So, right. so yeah, so I met her and there's been people that have biked it and a couple, there was only about three people that have hiked it. So. I was like, I'm because this. like I'd never heard of the ramble. Like, so what is it? Why is it so obscure? So it's the route is actually the route that John Muir, when he arrived in the United States in California, he decided I wanted to go to Yosemite. And the way that everybody was going, they were going through like Merced or Sacramento and taking wagons and the this that, and the other. But he goes, I want to go to the wild way, the way that people aren't going mm-hmm. to see all things wild. So he. Asked somebody which direction is the wild way, and they said what? And he What's said, "I don't want to go. Way? I don't want to go where the people <laughs> yeah. are." So he started walking uh, when he arrived in Oakland, and started kind of along the bay, kind of where I live. And I actually mm-hmm. used my house as like one night sleep station. And so yeah, he just went along this route and came in Yosemite through like the back way, not uh-huh. the traditional way. And so there's a lot of old roads that I was on that are, you still see pieces of pavement coming through, but now they're like totally abandoned. Nobody uses these. And I was like really cool being on there. Cause you know, he was on these roads too. Right. So they made the course as close as possible to the original way he walked. Of course you can't go in the freeway. And there was a couple of places where you were going up fire roads with, which were gnarly, right. like straight up and straight down, straight right. up and straight down. But they didn't want to put you on the freeway. Uh-huh. Of course. And this is different from the John Muir. Exactly. Trail. I've done that. I have yeah, the, yo-yo so record. the big thing is the yo-yo <laughs> record that yeah. blows people's minds. Four hundred and twenty. Nobody's attempted to break it after all these years. Really? Yeah. Don't know why. So he basically did the whole John Muir trail. And then he turned around on top of Whitney. And turned around and went back. Mm-hmm. And you go from, you. Went, I know you end up at the, at the. do you end up at like the base camp at Mount Whitney or do you go all the no, way to the to, peak? No, to the hut. You, the, to you the go hut. to the okay. hut. So the, right. And that's where it starts. Even if you start from the Whitney side, if you're starting your John Muir trail, even though you go up 11 miles, then you don't count that. Your start is at the hut. Right. <laughs> so once you're 11 miles at the highest point is where you start. But I started from Yosemite. Went to the top and then turned around and went back. Did you plan on doing the double, the yes. yo-yo? Or yeah. was it just you no, got there I, and you're like, I feel good. I'm going to keep going. <laughs> I know. <laughs> no, and 
Born on born to run, they, he acts like I just yeah. like made up. I was going to turn around. I'm like, who does that? Because that's, I mean, that's how I first became familiar yeah. with you, like through through Born to born Run, around, which yeah. I read before I got into all of this whole world, um, and that <laughs> kind of put you on the map and yeah. made, made a lot of people. And aware it was of. before all of our social media too, so right. like. Nobody, you know, you didn't have all the, the Facebook and anything like that, so you knew who these people were. And then when that, when the book came out, and then there was Facebook later on, people were able to Google like who these characters uh-huh. were in the story. Yeah. So yeah, and I definitely want to do a triple. I know my double's going to be broken, and so now I live in Bishop, and it's close enough to where I could do it. And I've I tried to do it a few years back, ago, and my uncle had passed away, so I had to bail yeah. out at one. So I'm going to definitely do a triple. <laughs> so Bishop's like in the middle of nowhere. Right? No, it's no. It it's isn't? like right next to Mammoth. It's a pu- oh, it is. 395 p- thousands of people drive through it their uh-huh. day. They get like a thousand truckers driving through. Right. So it's very popular. Trails it's everywhere, though. Everywhere. It's right. like climbers are there in the winter because of all the bouldering, buttermilk boulders and all of this. And I have trailheads, like 19 minute drive from my house, I'm up at 9,000 feet. Wow. And from there, I can go right out on the John Muir Trail. I can go 10 miles up, 10 miles down, and I'm on the John Muir Trail. That's pretty cool. So, but you were just recently moved there, right? Where were yep, you two living before? Ago. So the Bay Area, Fremont, near San uh-huh. Jose. So yeah, I yeah. was born and raised there and lived there pretty much all my life. I was working at, 12, at Whole Foods for 19 years, and uh-huh. I'm still seasonal with them. But my boyfriend uh, has been working for almost a year now with Sierra Life Flight, and so he's a pilot. Not helicopter, but airplane, and so. Right. So when you live on live on the east side of Sierra, the ambulances can't get you to a hospital fast enough. So that's why we have air ambulance airplanes. Oh, I see. That's interesting. He's a pilot. Yeah. So yeah, because we're four hours, three to four, three and a half to four hours from Reno, and then four hours from LA. So Mm -hmm. those are your closest major hospitals. I mean, Mm -hmm. we have a hospital in Mammoth, and we have a hospital in Bishop, but. If you need any significant anything, you he's have to, the dude. He's the dude. He comes yeah. and gets you. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, are you able to like make all this work on on sponsor relations? Like, do you can you make a living doing this? How does that work? No, no? <laughs> that's a shame. You should be yeah. able to. Well, you know, with my book, I'm hoping to make some money on that and yeah. speaking and stuff like that uh-huh. will definitely help. And I am. I mean, I, with a lot of my sponsors, you know, it's like they give you discount codes and the more you sell, the you sure. know, if people are going through your avenues and sell, buying stuff, you get money. So I, I'm actually yeah. making money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Quite yeah. a bit of money. Yeah, I got so it. I guess I could live on it. I mean, my boyfriend. <laughs> Depends on how you want to live, <laughs> If I, I guess, lived by myself, right? I'd be living yeah. on the street. <laughs> so, <laughs> <Okay>. so no. <laughs> well, I want to drill into the details of the racing and the training yes. and how you live your life and all of that. But mm-hmm. but I, I want to go back to the beginning because the what, what got you here is so bananas. Yes. Um, so so you, you, you were born and raised in Fremont? Yes. And walk me through, give me a little taste of, of, of your childhood. So I was such a girly girl. Didn't even like getting dirt on me. Always in dresses and patent leather, little shiny shoes. And so my parents, I loved dance. That was my thing when I was uh-huh. growing up. I loved taking dance lessons, tap dance, things like that. And my parents always thought I was very quiet. And I was always like with a book and kind of hiding and to myself. And they're like, well, we need to put her in sports because she's like in team sports. So she's more interactive with other kids, which I had no desire to do do and I hated sports altogether but my father was a soccer coach and my brother played soccer who was younger so Uh I was forced into playing soccer and softball and I absolutely hated it I hated running I didn't want to run I didn't want to sweat I didn't want to get dirty I hated it all I just wanted to take dance lessons but my parents felt this need to put me in these other sports. And were you, up. were you always like an extrovert? Like, were you, what we in high school? Like where, who'd you hang oh, out no. with? Yeah. Like, no? <laughs> no, that's all another thing. You weren't like no. rocking the crazy looks from the get go. No, no, not when I was a little kid, but no, once I hit junior high school, uh-huh. that's when I started changing. And so then what I started happened? using drugs and drinking and things like that. I had two older sisters. So I always was kind of with the older crowd hanging out with their friends. But yeah, we moved when I was going into junior high school. So I just kind of got into it with the wrong crowd, yeah. like right off the bat, the kids that I met. And so started smoking. And What was going on at home that you think led you to that? Nothing. Other than, my parents were great. Yeah, yeah, there was nothing going on there. My father was the president of Fremont City Soccer. I mean, my brother played sports. And I just was being doing my own thing. Right. Yeah. You my just sister had, this had gotten married. Wild streak yeah. that you had to explore. I was coming out. I was mm-hmm. coming into my own instead of my two older sisters were gone now, so I'm like my own person. Instead so, of shadow. so junior high that started yeah. happening. Yep. So started going out like, to discos, right. dance clubs, that whole 
thing. Just and was it just booze at that time? Yeah, or? pretty much, you know, smoking cigarettes and smoking pot once in a while mm-hmm. and mostly drinking and just going, like I said, to discos back then. Yeah. <laughs> you know, when I was well, soccer dad, <laughs> soccer dad probably wasn't too happy about that. Well, you know, he was in his own thing with the, my brother in the yeah. sports, you know, and uh-huh. I was playing soccer at the time too. Right. So it wasn't until I got into junior high school that I was just like, this is what I want to do. And my father passed away at seven when I was mm-hmm. 17. Mm-hmm. And so that just put me like doing, getting crazier. Right. You know, cause my mom now had to deal with me and my brother, my sisters were already older and they were married and had their own families. And so my brother, then my brother was with my father when my father died. So then my brother, How did he who die? was, it, it didn't, he didn't, it didn't, he didn't take it very well. And it mm. took, he ended up going into recovery when he was like 15. Cause he watched my father die, tried to save my father from having a massive heart attack at 49 years old. Yeah, and it was like he was healthy. He ran, but he smoked, you know, and he had quit smoking, but he ate meat and stuff like that. But mm-hmm. it's not genetic. His his parents lived till their 90s. Mm-hmm. So, but, yeah. So that set your, your brother off on That set my brother off, kind of set me off. Bit. And then my mom was trying to focus on my brother, and I was just going off on my own and then decided not to go to school. And my mom's like, you need to do something because you can't just not do, you know, go to school. You need to pick something you want to do. So I went to cosmetology school. Uh-huh. And so I was doing that and still like partying, going to the clubs and living at home still though. Yep. Right. Living at home still. And then I moved out after I graduated from cosmetology school and got a job and started, uh, I was living with a boyfriend of mine and his family and we were in and out of, you know, it was a horrible relationship, back and forth, breaking up, you know, just, he was in a band, and I decided... Of I, course, drummer? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he was, was he a drummer? No, he was a lead singer. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so then we kind of, you know, he was cheating on me, and then I saw, met somebody else, and I started cheating on him, and so it was just easy enough to leave that relationship, and so we had this huge blowout, and I ended up with this other guy, and this is not when I was on drugs. I was still, I was just drinking a lot, and... You know, drinking a lot, getting drunk, you know, when I'd go out. And so this other guy was a speed dealer. And at the time, I didn't know that because all my friends were like, don't tell her that you do that. And I would notice people coming in and out of the house and leaving and, you know. And then finally one night we were going to L.A. to go to a goth club because I was really big in the goth scene at this point. And, the, you know, they were all doing speed. And I was like, I'll do some, you know. And so it started from there. And it was just like on the weekends I would do it. And then at one point I was... I went to a Lollapalooza with a friend, and she's. I felt like shit. And I'm, she's like, just do some more. And I'm like, no, 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 I only like to do it on the weekends. And she goes, you'll feel better. And I was like, okay, so I'll do it. So that moment was the turning point for me to be like a major addict with it. Uh-huh. So, I, so when you say speed, are you talking about meth? Meth, yeah. So smoking meth or No, I was or just smoking, snorting, snorting it, it yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. And my boyfriend at the time was shooting it up, but I didn't right. even, pr- I pretended like I didn't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you knew. Because I wanted my drugs, you knew, but you I didn't care what he was doing. <laughs> tried to pretend like it was, yeah, yeah. In fact, I was so into the drugs that... I would pretend that I was buying it for somebody else and use my own money to buy more from him. He gave me so much a day, but then I was doing my amount that he was giving me and buying more from him. Right. Wow. <laughs> I know. Um, and, at, and at the time, were you partying in Fremont or were you going into yeah, San Francisco? Yeah, I was in San Francisco and what San were the, Jose. What clubs were you Just going all the goth clubs that yeah. are there, Drug Six. I mean, they just had all these funky So what, what was it about the goth scene? That, I just loved that you it. Connected with, yeah. I just loved the like, music. What's that world and, like? I don't know anything about that. Very, you know, dark, negative. Yeah, <laughs> depressing. A lot of brooding. <laughs> very depressing. Yeah. And I used to come drive to LA a lot because we'd the be cure, awake all night. A lot of the Cure. Yeah. Uh-huh. And but those guys never even did drugs. No, <laughs> I know. <laughs> so it's like yeah. you look at these bands. But my boyfriend was in a band at the time, so he was the lead singer for a band, and what they was that? opened. What was it called? His band was called uh, Flesh A Go Go, uh-huh. and they were opening for. God, I'm trying to remember. They opened for My Life with the Thrill Kill Cult a few times, and so, you know, it was that all that industrial kind of goth music. Yeah. So. And 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 what was the experience like of of doing math for the first time? Like it was like doing a bunch like? of coffee, <laughs> like yeah. just you know, and it was like I felt like I conquered the world, like. You, when you do it, you're like, oh, you know, just chatty, like how I am now. <laughs> like confidence. <laughs> yes. Good energy. Yep. In and the then beginning. you just want to keep doing it, right? Like yeah. you stay up for three days. You get days super or whatever. creative. I'm like, oh, I'm going to make stuff and get crafty and make uh-huh. all the. I was your, always making Clean it. your house yeah. and things like that. I was making outfits, like killer outfits. People mm-hmm. were just like so impressed with like what I was whipping up. You know, and I didn't know anything about anything and just started sewing and making really cool outfits. I always wanted to have the coolest outfit on in the club. So right. that was my thing. And what, 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 what's the coming down 
part Horrible. of that feel like. Like you just get depressed. And if you're already suffering from mental illness, you know, which I didn't really know at the time, but I had a lot of that going on. It gets, you know, you just got to keep doing it right. to stay above that, you know, so you don't have that come down. Mm-hmm. So, and I remember at one point my boyfriend wanted to quit and I was like, oh, fuck no. <laughs> can't quit. That means I would have to quit and I'm not quitting. You're not quitting. Yeah. So I even came to a realization one day, just like looking at myself, this is my life. This is have to, this is how it has to be. Uh-huh. And I, you delude you know, yourself 20s. into thinking yeah. it's sustainable when it's not. And when it's not. No, in the beginning yeah. it's fun, but once you really truly become an addict, then there's no fun anymore. You're just chasing your it's drugs. It's a job. You're just chasing it. Yeah. And mm-hmm. When I watch shows about people like that, I just think, God, I was right there. I understand that. And it's sick. Mm-hmm. It's a sick world. Did you get to that place where you're stealing it and lying to people no. and all that kind mm-hmm. of thing? I had a job. You I did. worked in a hair salon, so right. I always had so a you're job. All, you were always able to buy it on, yes. the, on the up and But we up. were selling it. Yeah. So we were small dealers getting it and selling it to our friends. And then... Obviously, somebody told on us, and they didn't want to turn on their their dealer because that was the big guy. So they said that he he had got it from us. So the, the cops and him made the phone call, and I answered the phone and did the sell over the phone. So two days later, knock knock knock, busting in the door comes the police. Right. And that becomes like your moment of reckoning, like your your bottom with the whole Going thing. Going to jail was I want, scary. I want to work my way up to that, but I'm still. <laughs> okay. I want to know more about this phase of your life, like. When, when you kind of, when I was doing a little bit of research and due diligence on you, I mean, there's a lot of, you know, it, it paints this picture of uh, a tremendous amount of chaos. There's yes. like, um, there's incidents of, of sexual abuse, mm-hmm. emotional abuse, a string of like very unhealthy, abusive relationships. There's, yeah. <laughs> there's eating disorders thrown into there. There's OCD. There's, it's like, it's a perfect mixture of like, of like all kinds of childhood and psychological trauma that contributes to, you know, that's all driving you towards this moment where you end up in this jail cell. Yeah. And so I was sexually abused as a child by a family friend and I kept that inside all my life. And my parents even asked, did he touch you in such a way? And when you're a little kid and somebody tells you and you're, you know, you're, you respect them and look up to them, like you better not say anything. Mm -hmm. Something bad's going to happen to you. So then you're stuck. You lie to your parents and then you have nowhere to go, you know, and that kind of, I think, set everything. How old were you? I was nine. Uh Uh-huh. So, yeah. Fa- and a family friend or a yep, relative? Family friend. family friend. He was a relative. But he was always around our house. It was my oldest sister's friend. He was like in her wedding and like close friend. Like he was always at our house. Uh-huh. And it only happened the one time, but that was, that's enough to change your life. And what's it like carrying that secret around for so long? You know, shame. You're, you're scared. To, and as you get older, it's just like, oh, no. you know, it comes up. You think about it. You, you know, trauma comes up in life. And I, the, I just remember when I got clean and sober and when I finally was able to tell my mom mm-hmm. was the first time in my life I felt so at ease. Like knowing that I was able to tell her finally after she had asked me when I was younger and I lied in line. She's like, why didn't you, you know, and it's yeah, yeah, like, yeah. she just didn't understand. And I said, you don't understand, yeah. you know, and when I told her when I was like 27 or whatever. You've been like sober for like, what, like 25 years? 24 now, years. Like going to be 25 years, years right. in Jan or uh, June 24. So uh-huh. I have to do something really big. For so that. 96, <laughs> mm-hmm. 90, 94, yeah, 94. Oh, 94. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Long time. Um, but what is the, like when you now with perspective and that much time clean and sober, when you look back on, on that incident of, of sexual abuse, like how do you think about how that fueled like you're using? Like what is the relationship between Hiding the drug stuff. use and, yeah. and also like seeking out, you know, like you know, this sort of expression of of like unhealthy, you know, behaviors as a result of like harboring that shame and feeling like you can't tell anyone about it. So, yeah, I mean, it was a constant like hiding it. So if I drank and I was going to be with somebody and had a boyfriend and had to have sex, it's like if you're drunk or you're not aware of what's going on, it somehow feels better. Mm -hmm. Like you're not, you know, thinking about what happened to you. Because you, I mean, you must have had intimacy issues, like oh. you not trusting people. All the time. All that kind of thing, <laughs> All my life. Still, yeah. <laughs> not now, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, my boyfriend's so awesome. Uh-huh. No, as an adult, I'm like, you know, if people... If people, well, I was married and he cheated on me. Uh-huh. So I'm like, if people are going to cheat, they're going to cheat. They got an issue with themselves. You yeah. know, they, if they can't just say, hey, I don't want to be with you anymore, that's perfectly fine. I'm a big girl. I can accept it. But mm-hmm. but because of his alcohol and drug abuse and whatever, that's. Well, it's weird how childhood uh, trauma 
manifests itself later in life through the repetition of the pattern. Like you suffer this trauma and you would think (laughs) psychologically you would do everything in your power to move away from that type of social dynamic, but you seek it out because for whatever bizarre reason, there's a strange comfort in that or a familiarity. I I think so too. Just like I said, when I was marrying my ex-husband, he's nice. I mean, I don't, I don't want to say anything bad uh-huh. about him, but he wasn't for me, but he smoked pot and he drank a lot. It's like, why would I get, why would I go with somebody like that? Why would I marry somebody like that? People mm-hmm. were in shock. I mean, I met him in Yosemite. He was a climber and he just had this personality, like charming, fun. Yeah. And it was right after my mom had passed away. And it just like, I connected with him. I just thought he was like so fun and this, that, and the other. And 24 days later, I married him. Right. <laughs> so, and I was clean and sober. There was nothing wrong with me. Uh-huh. And, and then... And I, how long have you been sober at that point? Well, that was in 2002. So, I got sober in 1994. Yeah, yeah. So, I just wanted to save him, I guess. I mean, uh-huh. I don't know. Yeah, it's something <laughs> you like do in the unconscious me. mind that, that attracts you to that person. And, and often... Those those negative behavior patterns aren't necessarily manifest originally. Like no. you're just like, oh, they're awesome. Like they're nothing like that yeah. other person that I'm trying to yeah. get away and with. Like and then you're six the months in, and you're like, oh, they're exactly like that yeah. person. He yeah. he was definitely a different person. Uh-huh. And then he progressively. I mean, if he was not living in Yosemite and climbing, that was he was like just drinking and getting drunk and mm-hmm. just could he couldn't stand being like controlled in a controlled environment. He needed to be climbing. Yeah. <laughs> he was a dirt bag. <laughs> he needed to be in the dirt. Right. And if you have an eating disorder, meth is awesome. Oh yeah. Right. And I but my eating disorder really came up big time after I got clean and sober. Mm. Cause just trying to find some control and something and it like I became vegan and it was just like that was a good excuse to why I was getting really thin. And so that went on for a few more years. I mean all my life pretty much, you know, it's like the, the pictures in the magazines, as all of us women know, like growing up, it's like you have this image of somebody, which is not true because I have friends that are models and they don't look like those pictures except for right. when there's a picture of them. You know, it's like there's mm-hmm. so much airbrushing and things going on. And, and I like that nowadays they're using more normal people, average people, you know, so we don't have to show our young girls like this is how you should look when it's fake, you know? It's changing, but yeah. but there's, you know, a lot of it is the same. Exactly. You know? And I think that that speaks to um, something that is, that is, uh, that, that I see a lot of, which is if you're an addict, an alcoholic, or you have some kind of unhealthy predisposition, you can latch on to a seemingly healthy thing like I'm going to be a raw vegan or yeah. I'm going to be an ultra runner or pick, you know, behavior X. And you can shade your unhealthy behavior under the umbrella of something that people will socially approve of mm-hmm. um, when, you're re- when your relationship to that thing is very unhealthy. Yeah. Right. So you can there's tons of people in recovery and ultra running. There's a reason for that. Exactly. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> you can be very addictive in your training. And that's been something that I've had to you know, evolve into like. Am I is what is my relationship with this? Am I hiding? Is this making me a better person, or am I just using this as an outlet because I can't use drugs and alcohol anymore? Well, we kind of need something to take the we place. We do, it, and it, it is and healthy, it's healthier, but, but it, it is can healthier. become unhealthy it can when be, it rolls. Yeah, yeah, in your life. and and you can be a raw vegan when when it's really not about that. It's because you have an eating disorder, yeah. and this is a good way to like tell everybody that you're doing something good it's for true. yourself when you're actually not. Yeah. And, it's, and, and so, it's how do you like like have what is your sort of history with all of that, Ben? So you know, I the eating disorder was early on when my when I was running, so it just made sense. Like, oh, she's getting skinnier because I was already thin, and then you uh-huh. stop doing drugs and you start gaining. I was normal weight; it wasn't like I was yeah. overweight. And then I started running, and I became vegan at the same time. So then I realized I can control this. I was eating like two apples a day. It was like ridiculous. That's how controlling I was with what I was eating, and I wouldn't eat in front of people. And my mom's like, two apples a day. And how much are you running? (laughs) At that time, it was early on, but I was Uh still running like eighty miles a week. Yeah, so (laughs) two apples a day. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. I live not now. That's the Christian Bale diet (laughs) from that movie, The Machinist, where he got down to like 100 pounds. Yeah. Well, if you want to get really thin. And then it got to a point where I was exercising so much, I was rollerblading to the gym one day and rollerblading back, and it was like 100 degrees out, and 
And I like passed out when I got home and my mom's like, what the hell is wrong with you? Right. And I was like rollerblading, working out in the gym. And I was like, I don't know. And she's like, yeah, that's not good. So I went to the doctor's and she was like, do you have an eating disorder? And I'm like, no, I'm vegan. <laughs> Right. Like I always use that. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm talking about. And it wasn't until I started training for ultras that I actually met a guy on the trail, and he's like, "You, you know, I was saying how I was going to do a hundred miler, and he goes, "You can't do a hundred miler." He goes, "You're too thin," and I was like, "What?" And it and it's dawned on me at that point that like maybe there is something going on. And I had went to the doctors and they saw, like I had a heart murmur and I felt like I was going to have a heart attack at some point. And then Mm. I'm like thinking about my dad. I'm like, shit, I'm going to die, you know? And so it kind of, I kind of changed it and started reading more nutritional stuff, like about nutrition and supplements and, you know, having a different relationship with food, like eating and taking supplements that were going to nourish my body without eating the junk, but still eating a ton more calories that I was eating instead of apples and a few things uh-huh. and eating more stuff like, you know, quinoa and adding other things. And, and I changed it, you know, I, I helped myself. I mean, and I did do a lot of reading up on it, like right. anorexia and stuff. And, and back then I was really self-help, you know, early on in recovery, reading every book I could. And I thought, yeah, this is, this is going to take me out. Like the drugs took me out and just reading people's stories and books mm-hmm. I had gotten a couple of books and I was just like, yeah, I don't want what this. Were the, to what were the books? I don't even were, remember the name yeah. of them, but it was a woman. Two of them were by women that wrote about their, their times of anorexia and stuff. It was in Barnes and Nobles. I just happened yeah. to be looking and uh-huh. got books on eating disorders. <laughs> All right. So you, you make this uh, meth sale over the phone and you get busted and you end up in jail. That was scary. Yeah. Was it just, I, how long were you in jail for? Uh, like less than two days, but I was in overnight, yeah. <laughs> which I didn't think the cop told me, oh, you won't be in overnight. And so when I'm going in and I'm going through the process and you're sitting like in a lobby, I mean, I've never been to jail. So I was just thinking all bars in this, but it was like the, a waiting room at the airport or something. And, uh-huh. and this is just from what I can remember. In Fremont? In my mind. It was in, uh, it was a woman's correctional facility in, uh, Milpitas. Uh So it was called Elmwood. And so in San Jose is where they took the men to that jail. And then Elmwood was for the females. And so there was a lot of interesting people in there. Just me remember, you know, here's me all gothed out and, and just going in through the whole process and where they strip you down and just they treat you like shit. I mean, cause you're a criminal, I guess in their eyes. And I'm just like, I'm not supposed to be here. (laughs) Really? And they're like, just get over here. You know, and the whole time I'm like, well, they're, they're, I'm not supposed to be here. They're going to let me out. They should be letting me out now. Yeah, don't you know who I think I am? Yeah, exactly. And so even the guy that took my photo, so I worked in a hair salon in downtown San Jose. He was one of my clients. So that was just The like, guy who worked in the jail that mm-hmm. took your, your I already knew intake he was photo? In the jail. Yeah, it was just like, oh, God. You know, just so embarrassing, you know, to have been uh-huh. going through this. And now here's a person that knows who I am and knows what I'm going through. And it was a dark time. Yeah. And so going in, like they hand me the, the clothing to put on. Like after, you know, I'm in there for several hours before they even do that. And I'm like, no, I'm not supposed to stay here. And they're like, yeah, you're going into whatever with the rest of the people. So you get your outfit on, your flip flops and, you know, nothing fit. It was like all falling off of me. I was so skinny and march us all in. And, you know, and I remember the cops telling me, he goes, if you do get in there, I'll make sure that they put you in a cell by yourself. So I did end up in a cell by myself. And so when I went into the, you know, and I'm crying, I'm just like, I don't belong here. I don't belong here. And there's like, it's like a mirror. It's not really a mirror. It's a piece of sheet metal, you know, because you don't want you to cut yourself, cut somebody with them breaking a mirror. And so I'm just looking at myself in this thing and thinking, what am I, what am I doing here? I, how did I get here? This is, you know, my whole life. I'm just thinking, oh my God, this is not who I am. And so it dawned on me, I need to do something. I need to change. So I remember sitting on the bed and laying down and it's like these fully blankets. In fact, they use them at 200s and I will put those blankets on me. I'm like at the sleep station. I'm like, Reminds get the fully blanket away from me. I don't want to go to jail. That's an interesting full circle thing <laughs> though. True. Like it's this is the same blanket, but it my is. life is so I different. I hate them so that I, I mean, I had a crew this time. So I'm in my car with my, you know, at the sleep stations with my, sleeping bag on. No, those things freak me out. And there's times like literally I'm freaked out. I'm like, uh-huh. get that thing away from me. But those are kind of cool God shots too, because <laughs> you're like, oh, this is, it's such a, a vivid tactile like memory that takes you back. That makes you remember where know you came that from. I don't want to ever be right? there again. Yeah. So I know what I need to do not to mm-hmm. ever, ever be there. It's like a, it's like a relapse dream. Yes. <laughs> and mm-hmm. you're awake and everything's a relapse dream and then you're awake for a hundred hours. 
Yeah. <laughs> so, so, uh, so you have this moment, mm-hmm. you make this decision. And so and that I, was it. Well, yeah, you know, I mean, was it, they assigned me a public defender. So I had to go to court right away. Mm-hmm. And so I got what out the, the next charge? day. So they were going to charge me with everything. My boyfriend got charged for selling possession, like everything. And he kept trying to take the blame saying, no, she had nothing to do with it. Although I was the one that sold it on the phone, but the, he was taking all the blame when they came in and raided the house and all that. And he showed him where we cooperated, uh-huh. but he's like, just, you know, she's never been in trouble. You know, he had been in trouble before and they saw that and the judge saw that. And I was talking with my attorney and he goes, he goes, usually they're going to charge the female with the same amount of crime as their boyfriend or whatever. And he goes, but he goes, he might be nice to you and we'll see We're, you have a job you have you know you've never yeah. been in trouble so with that he went in front of them and said you know she has a job she'll go into drug diversion she'll go to meetings and so then he said okay let's see let's put her into an outpatient program go to NAAA every day either one of them and get the paper signed and I was checking back every two weeks and yeah. so I was going and this went on for three months in, to six months and then they finally, I was off a drug diversion after six months with no no mm. record. They let all of that go. Oh, good. So no felony charge. No, yeah. He, and they didn't try to roll you into, you know, trying to get somebody above you, like uh, try to cut a deal, like tell well, us. Well, no. See, that's why the, the guy that turned us in, they, he pretended like we were the big wigs. Uh, we didn't, yeah, they uh-huh. couldn't do anything because Jason was going to tell him where he right. got it. So he was fine with going to jail. And he did, he had he spent three months in jail and then three months house house arrest mm-hmm. so and he got his thing wherever they they wipe your sl- slate clean years later i mean he's been in re- clean and sober for all these years too uh-huh. so yeah so court family. order to na and aa yep how so, was that interesting you know i was in downtown san jose so there was a lot of gang ex-gang members uh-huh. in my meetings and i would you just get that court card signed yeah but i just was like feeling like i did nothing you know my what I got arrested for was nothing compared to what these people see on a daily basis and how they were raised mm-hmm. and, you know, but they're in recovery too and trying to better themselves. But I was just like, my God, I can't even talk because I don't have, I'm just like this white chick that, so what? She got, you know, she's hanging out in the clubs and she got arrested. Like my story didn't matter. And so I did just you, always, but did you embrace or accept the fact that you were an addict or an, an oh, alcoholic yeah. or just mm-hmm. somebody who got in trouble? No, no, yeah. I, I knew I was. And what's the, what's the, what's the relationship between the meth and the booze? Like, well, I stopped actually really drinking after I, I stopped drinking pretty much when I started doing math because Uh you don't really get drunk anyways when you, and I'd rather do the math. No, unless you want to go to sleep. So, but then after I did get arrested, I, I was drinking for a little bit, a couple months after that until they Mm -hmm. were like, no, you're not supposed to drink at all either. So that's why went from the time I got arrested till June 24th is my actually sobriety date because uh-huh. I was still drinking here and there when I went out on occasion, but I wasn't doing drugs. And clean and sober ever since. Yeah, June 24th uh-huh. was my day. But like, it is not really your thing, right? No, you know, I and I appreciate that people that helps him. My brother goes to AA. He's been uh-huh. off and on for years, back and forth into recovery. And now he's been in it for a long time, and he it's great tool. I would say I I think. That's a you know the main thing of starting my recovery was that, but then going to therapy really helped me more because I felt like I just had deeper issues and you know I you know I just it's hard for me to sit around and just listen to the same stories over and over when I would just want to move forward in life mm-hmm. and I like talking about my past because it helps people but it's like I have so much more in front of me that it's like here's what this is what I did let's keep going you know let's talk about the future let's talk about good things we can keep doing, you know, it's like when people say, I want to do this, that, and the other, but I can't do it. And I, you know, I'll wait a couple of months and I'm like, no, do it now. You might not be here tomorrow, yeah. you know? So, mm-hmm. but it definitely helped me, but I just, you know, I prefer going to the mountains as my church yeah. and praying and just thinking. And that's where I do all my thinking. I like running alone and seeing so much in, in, you know, I, I take something away every time I'm out in the mountains and just running even on the streets, like a bird or this, or that, and I just am grateful. That's grateful. your church. That's yeah. your AA meeting. Yep, it is. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting because for me, um, I mean, that's a huge part of my sobriety and my recovery. But for me, like, that's not enough. Like, I still, like, I go to AA, you know, like, I'm yeah. part of the recovery community. And, and I think... Now people sometimes get confused. They know my story and they think like, oh, well, 
I put the drugs and the alcohol behind me and now I'm just going to train and like that's sobriety. And it's like, no, that's not like, at least for me, like yeah. I'm only speaking for myself. Um, that's not, an, that's, I've, I know from firsthand experience <laughs> that I need something, that I need a more structured program beyond that. That's a contributing factor that keeps sure. me in line. But um, for me, I need to have a connection with a higher power. I need a spiritual program. I need to be of service to other alcoholics like who are still sick and all of that, you know, <laughs> yeah. or, or I'll go sideways pretty quickly. Yeah. And thank God I've never wanted to go yeah, sideways. Good for so, you. More yeah, power you to know, you. I guess, and I look at me now and I think, well, that makes perfect sense because look at how much I get into something. It's like mm-hmm. my mind goes and it's like, I ain't doing that anymore. That's it. But that's very alcoholic. You know that, yeah. right? That ability to focus. It's like harnessing the best of what it means to be like that kind of human being and channeling it in the right direction. Mm-hmm. Right. I think, I think alcoholics and addicts are, look, they're incredibly crafty and focused people. Like when yeah. you're, as you said, like when you're using, like you're, you, there is no way you're not going to find that meth that day. Yeah, no exactly. matter what it takes, it's going to happen. Well, that's what you look right? for. Yeah. And then if you can take that level of intensity and place it in a healthy direction, then the world explodes in a good way. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right, so you get out, you're sober, you're doing the whole deal. Um, when does the running create So the now? running doesn't stop, start until two years later. So I, uh-huh. I'm, you know, working out in a gym, I'm getting healthy. So I'm doing things and, like I said, eating healthy. And it wasn't did until... Did you do, when did the vegan, did the vegan thing vegan precede? Vegan start right away. So actually, oh, I became a vegetarian when I was nine. Ah. We raised animals. So we, we didn't live on a farm. So my, like I said, my dad always had stuff going on. So he bought like nine head of cattle and my sisters were in FFA, which is Future Farmers of America. And I was younger. So I was in 4-H. They put me in the 4-H program. And I had a lamb and we had the stairs. And so before I ended up getting the lamb, we had the nine head of cattle and then they grew up and they went away. They got sold. And there was one still on the ranch, and I named him Charlie. My parents used to always say, don't name those. Those are not pets. Uh-huh. Don't name those animals. Yeah, the more and you I, personalize them. But we had a horse them. and stuff, and I was like, well, his name's Charlie. He's white, and his name's Charlie, and that's what I'm calling him. And I'd go up to him and hug him and whatever. So then all the other ones were gone, and Charlie was still there, and then he went away. And the day, like within a few days, I come home from school, and my brother opens up the freezer. We had a meat f- freezer in the garage. And he's all, look, Charlie's in the freezer. And that was it. And, and that you were changed. Nine, you were nine. Nine. Uh-huh. And it was devastating to me. When I see, it's so funny, I was just at the fair and I saw these girls like with little lambs and stuff. And I was like, oh my God, they don't understand what's going to happen to their mm-hmm. animal. You raise these. So yeah, Charlie was in the freezer and I told my mom, I'm not eating anything out of there. I'm not mm-hmm. eating a hamburger ever again. And she didn't force me to. I mean, she was Italian, so she would take the sausage out or the, you know, whatever, the meatball. And so even though there was meat sauce in there or whatever, it was not a connection that I had. But as long yeah. as there was no meat, a hamburger, like I didn't eat a hamburger when I went to McDonald's. I would eat fish and chicken growing up. But so then my lamb, you know, I was eating lamb still, at, I think, until that point to the following year when I went to the fair once again, had my little lamb, auctioned it off. I was all excited. And this boy said to me, you know, they're getting, somebody's going to eat them. And I was like... No, they're not. And then I thought, oh, my God, Charlie, my lamb. Like, I thought somebody was just going to keep them for a pet like I uh-huh. did. You know, it wasn't a connection because I just loved animals. How old animals. were you then? Ten. Uh-huh. And so I just went off. I just started bawling, and I ran to the pen where he was, and I just laid in there. And my dad came and found me, and he's like, no, 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 they're going to keep him for a stud. And I think, you know, I don't know this, the real story, but I'm sure my dad told the guy, like, go tell her that you're not going to eat him. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I don't know. So he came over, he goes, no, no, we're going to st- keep him for a stud. And I was like, I don't know what that is, but right. <laughs> so there went lamb. So, so at a young age, I was very aware of right. stuff and I'm very sensitive towards animals growing up and you know, I had a duck, and my brother killed my duck, and just like, you know, he's a wild. Well, your child. relationship with Truman right now <laughs> is like on a whole other level. I love most him. dog owners. Yeah, I'm super bummed that you didn't bring him. I know. Now I feel really bad. I should have. For people that are listening or watching, she, well, they're probably mad that I didn't bring. Him. Yeah, they're like, we're. I mean, your dog's like famous. I, more, right? Yeah, more famous so than me. So Truman's like twelve or thirteen now. How old he's is he? He's twelve years, seven months. So he's uh-huh. getting up there. And I've only had him for six and a half years. I rescued him. Right. And uh, what kind of dog is he? He's, he's a like miniature a dachshund. Dachshund. And uh, and, he, and he's dog. run ultras. Five fifty k's. Five fifty k's on those <laughs> so tiny his four little legs. Inch legs, nine pounds, can run. 
50K, starting at six and a half, or he, start, he ran his first 50K at seven. Uh -huh. <laughs> and you trained him like you would train a human, right? Exactly. Just start very slow. And he and just was following It's like, I can't believe a little dog like that can run a 50K. Nobody can. <laughs> and there's people emailing me that have wiener dogs. <laughs> <laughs> do they? Do you get people angry at you like this is abuse or well, something? Well, they have, but yeah. I have. Re I mean, my doctor, my vet is he's like vet approved, and I have friends that are ultra runners that are vets, and they said we are taught in veterinarian school that these guys have all these back issues, and they're like we never think they could run because they have back issues. Well, the back issue can't happen from running; it happens from jumping, mm. and it makes perfect sense to have them run low to the ground keeping them thinner and just getting them checked. And it's right. like, he's just happens to be an amazing little guy. And he has always been fed approved. I've had full body x-rays. I mean, it's not like I'm just some crazy lady letting my dog run. And I knew that people would come out of the woodwork and try to say stuff. And it's like, I got proof. I have vets that approve of him doing this. And now he has gotten older and he has a heart murmur. So we've tapered him back to 10 miles at the most. 10 miles at the most. Yeah. And with those and, tiny <laughs> little legs, I mean, if you broke it down by strides, I mean, the 50K is probably like a 200 mile. Well, that's what I think. What yeah. you, you know what I mean? And, and, and what's the deal with the, the, you put like ski goggles on Yes. Them. Well, he's had eye injuries and thousands of dollars, like his surgery on his eyes because he's low to the ground, running trails, pokey things uh -huh. are right on the trail, right. eye level. So he had, one of his corneas got really scratched and he had to have surgery on it. And that's the eye that usually has problems. And he has eye drops for the rest of his life because he doesn't mm. make tears. And so my vet's like, the best thing you can do, because I swear, like every six months, it was like a major eye issue. And the last one was last year. At Tahoe 200, we were sweeping the course. Me and him were pulling the ribbons, and he was with me. And I had these trekking poles, and it had a sharp point, and he ran into the point and scratched his eye again. Uh, and it took three months for it to heal. Uh -huh. So finally, we're like, okay, we gotta, gotta do. You know, he started with the regular little doggle ones that were individual like glasses, mm -hmm. and he would wear them. But you, he, if the minute you stopped, they were off and they uh -huh. were ruined. And so. A friend of mine, actually, she's like, there's this company called Rec Specs that makes these really cool goggles. But at the time, they didn't make extra small. They were only making small, so they were way too big. Not for dogs, though. For they are for dogs. Oh, they are, specifically, are specifically designed specifically for dogs. dogs. Oh, yeah. Like a lot of law because enforcement, this is a thing? Like, law enforcement I, really? dogs wear them. Yeah, it's a thing. Truman's the only dog that I've ever nope, seen wear a ski mask. Look them up. In the, <laughs> okay. I, I know. I'm, you know, because dogs uh -huh. get damaged just from the sun just like we do. That's yeah. why you hear so many dogs of having, like... Glycoma and these certain things yeah, cataracts. from the cataracts from the sun and stuff, and it makes sense. But like I said, he's always gotten scratched, and so these mm -hmm. these are so much better. He doesn't have the, the gunk like I was constantly cleaning gunk. And, and he, he likes wearing it. He, he yeah, he doesn't it. mind cool if I stop. It. Then he wants them off when he's done, uh -huh. so he knows when they come on. Like I won't put him on a road run, you know, because it's like let him not have to wear them. But definitely on the trail, there's so much debris that gets in his eyes. And so. do you have a leash when you're running with him, or does he follow So when we're you? off trail, we don't need to. Like on places where you don't need to have a leash, nope, he's not uh -huh. on leash. Yeah, on the trail. And what happens when you have the occasional, like, rattlesnake encounter? Or He's always behind me, so he yeah. doesn't. he's not ever been one to run, like, way in front of me, So uh -huh. which is good, because most people are like, what do you do? And I'm like, we've never had that problem. And he's, like, beeline straight towards the at rattlesnake when I jumped out of the way, and I'm like, Truman, Truman. And finally, like, he looked at me, and I was, like, able to grab him. Like, he was almost on one on top of one that was curled quarrel, uh, up. And yeah, yeah, I was yeah. like, that would have not been good because he's so little. And if he gets bit, I mean, there's yeah. anti-venom, but in the Bay Area where I was at, it was, like, a 40 minutes away for yeah, the anti-venom for the dogs. It, Around here, I'm sure you guys have it. In yeah, but it's still, I mean, we lost it's a dog to rattlesnake bites. Uh, yeah. So, so I know it's, it's, it's a, I mean, it's, it's serious yeah. if that happens, yeah. but I think that's totally cool. Like I remember, it reminds me one time I did the, the Alcatraz swim. Oh, the this shark was, fest. This was like a long, long yeah. time ago. Uh, and the guy, the organizer of it, I think it was on New Year's day. Like it did it like the, you know, on the, the coldest day or whatever. Oh, of course. <laughs> but the organizer at the time, if memory serves me, had a black lab and apparently this black, like this, this lab, his favorite thing was to do this swim. And he would do the swim from Alcatraz with everybody right. and he would beat half the field and he was so excited, like running around yeah. in circles. And then he'd run, he, you know, swim up onto the beach and run around and like, you know, that is so lick cool. everybody. Like it was like, he was like on fire, yeah. you know, and who would have thought like, it's supposed to be, oh, who, you know, these prisoners could never make it out of Alcatraz and die. And, like, the dogs, like, out there just, like, beating half of these swimmers out That's there. That's amazing. So. Yeah, I mean, animals are pretty mm. amazing. If they find a passion and love like we do, if 
they, they can do it. Yeah. You know, and like I said, I've never, I've never got to a point where Truman has laid down and been exhausted. And said, I can't go anymore. Yeah. Now, I mean, granted, like if Courtney owned him, he would probably been dead. Right. <laughs> so I'm not like pushing him like that. Have you ever been in a race though, where he's like, I can't go anymore and nope, you have never. to drop out or whatever? No, 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 uh-huh. no. He's running ahead in a race when he gets a bib on and I take him off leash. He's running with the other runners, like in front of me. And they're like, wow. oh no, the wiener dog's beating us. Uh-huh. You know, he, that's when he runs in front of me because he keeps thinking I'm up there. And then he's like, oh, that's not her. Where did she go? Uh-huh. You know, why isn't oh she coming? God. So yeah, when he see, when he gets a bib on, he knows that's a different thing uh-huh. that we're in a race. That's so interesting. Yeah. It's funny. All right. So, so where does the vegan thing come in then? So where do you make that switch? So I was vegetarian already before I got clean and sober and decided the day that I quit doing drugs that me and my friend Katrina were talking about, oh, we were, we're going to go vegan. And when, when we were on drugs, we have these conversations uh-huh. about being vegan. <laughs> so yeah, uh-huh. exactly. So that was the perfect time. I said, you know, I'm not doing drugs anymore. I'm going vegan. So yeah. that's when it all started. Uh-huh. So the same day that pretty much I quit, you know, doing drugs, I quit eating meat. What was that decision about for you, though? <sighs> Just to get myself healthy like, again. To get almost healthy. like a purification. Exactly. Yeah. Like, I'm not doing that toxic stuff. I'm going to get clean and sober, and I'm going to eat, uh-huh. eat good. And I'm glad I did. That helped. But, you know, there's unhealthy vegan. Mm-hmm. There's eating a lot of sugar and crap that is not so healthy. And back then... It was mostly like you didn't have really almond milk or stuff like that. It was mostly soy. And I have a major intolerance with soy. Mm. Like I get major stomach issues from a lot of soy. I can't do it. So I try to avoid that. And back then it was like mostly soy. Everything was soy, tofu soy. And it's like now we're, it's so wonderful. We have all this plant-based, you know, beyond meat and like just great, like without soy in it or gluten and stuff like that. Yeah, it's come a long way. It has for sure. But it's also easier to be un- an unhealthy vegan with all the crazy, you know, you can get all the cupcakes and the whatever, yes. you know. I got a bunch of pastries over at the mm-hmm. Juicy Ladies. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, Juicy Ladies is pretty, they have Their really stuff is, super healthy food there. They do. Yeah. I love that place. It's good. Um, so you do that and then, but it's still a spell before the running creeps Yeah, in. so two years. So I'm working out, doing my thing at the gym and I went back to school. So I had never graduated high school. So uh-huh. I went through the adult school. And I could have you're, taken... You're, you're a cosmetologist at the time? Like yep, you're doing I was hair. just working part-time. So I moved back home to the Bay Area, to Fremont from San Jose uh-huh. and working part-time. And I decided I wanted to go back to school and get my high school diploma, just like a normal person, like sit back in the classroom. So I went through the adult program. I could have taken my GED and got over it mm-hmm. and been out. But I thought, no, I'm going to go back like where I should have been. And so I was going to cosmetol... I mean, I was uh, going to adult school and I was actually working at... Um, a bagel store just part-time and then working in the salon part-time. And I was in a Barnes and Nobles and there was a flyer. Well, actually, let me backtrack. So I had this other little wiener dog I used to take for a walk Mm -hmm. because I've always had wiener dogs. Pre-Truman. No Truman, pre-Truman. This was Oscar Mayer wiener. Okay. (laughs) Of course. I know. (laughs) So I was, I would take him on these three mile walks. And one day I just, out of nowhere, I don't know what possessed me, but I'm like, I'm going to run. I'm going to run today. I'm going to go out for a run and not take him. So I went and I ran my little route three miles and I was like, whoa, I ran, you know, and that was really cool. So I was in Barnes and Nobles and there was a flyer in the back of the store and there was a flyer for like 5k, 10k. And I was like, oh, I'm going to, that's a 10k. I'm going to run that 10k. I only ran once three miles and it Uh was in two weeks. And I asked my mom, I said, do you want to walk the 5k? Cause she walked every day and she's like, yeah, I'll go. So a couple weeks after I started running, I entered this 10K, ran, like, no, didn't know a pace, thought I was going to pass out. I was still in, like, wearing all black in that phase, still goth phase. It was, uh-huh. like, hot out. <laughs> and I, Did you I, have, like, the all black no hair way. and, like, white, you yeah. know, like, <laughs> face and the whole yeah, thing? Yeah, and I was wearing all yeah. black and black shorts and black uh-huh sweatshirt and whatever. So I finished and I was like, wow, you know, that was a big thing. And so I got back to the vehicle and on our car, there was a flyer for the San Francisco marathon. And I was like, when is this? And it was like three months. I'm like, how far is a marathon? I know it's far. It's like 20 miles. And I had to call my friend Kevin. I'm like, Kevin, do you know how far a marathon is? And he's like, yeah, 26 miles, 0.2 miles. And I said, I'm going to sign up for it. Mm -hmm. So I sent my check in because that's like (laughs) pre-anything, computer stuff. So I sent it in and I had three months to change so I or train. So I went into the Barnes and Nobles, got a book that said how to train for a marathon, 
had to skip ahead to three months training program. Right. And I read that I was, you know, okay, Sunday, nine mile run. And so uh, there was no GPS, Garmin's, none of this. So I got in my little car, odometer, (laughs) Uh drove four and a half miles out and it was the gas station. And I was like, perfect, that's my turnaround tomorrow and then I'll run back. So that's how I started my training from Uh that book. First day, nine miles. miles. Exactly. And just, I felt like I was, it was, you know, I never knew anybody other than my dad and my brother that had run. And, you know, so none of my friends ran and this was me just doing it for me, you know, like finding my own way. Uh-huh. And so doing that, I was just like, wow. And like I said, no, I didn't know anybody that ran marathons and my family and friends were like, whoa, you're crazy, you know. And but so, looking back on it now, like, what do you think that switch was that got flicked? Like, what is it about running that spoke to you? I think it was, it gave me confidence and it gave me a passion, something to strive for. So, and just, I needed something. Like the structure. Because I had no going out to nightclubs anymore. Uh-huh. I mean. The, You're sober for a couple of years. Yeah, and I just felt I kind of alone. I assume you had to change your friends. And, yeah, yeah and that's what I'm saying. That. I yeah. was kind of alone. Yeah. And so running made me not feel alone. Like it, it gave me something. It gave me a purpose. Uh-huh. And, and it made me feel good. And you finished that first marathon. I did. And it was like, I my, I was sore. Yeah. And I, <laughs> I, now I think about it. When we're in the 200 mile races, we're like, remember when we ran our first marathons? Holy crap. Like you couldn't walk. And, and like after a hundred uh-huh. mi- or 200 miles, I'm like a little stiff that day. Everybody's like, uh, 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 like right after they finish, but I go take an Epsom salt bath. Then I come back to watch the finishers finish several hours later. And I'm like, they're like, you don't even look like you did right. anything. Right, right, right. That's <laughs> it's weird how wow. your, our bodies just like, Ooh. uh-huh. And running that marathon, I think I read, like, you, you had to run past all these clubs yes. that used to party. So I was running exactly yeah. past all the clubs, and I was just like, wow. So each time I passed a place, I'm like, look where you are now. Yeah, that difference. You know, difference. it just gave me, like, this strength as I mm-hmm. propelled myself forward. Like, look at you now. You know, it's like, who would have ever thought when you were in there looking out on the road that you'd be running past all of this? And was there an idea like, this is what I want my life to be about now? Or has it just been a natural progression of becoming more and more invested? I just, I just knew it was going to be part of my life. I you wanted it to be part of my life, yeah. yeah. And you what, know. How did you know that? Like, what, was, what, what do you think it was? And even in the middle of that first marathon, I was planning my next one. Uh-huh. I hadn't even got to the yeah. finish line, not even halfway. I'm like, <laughs> I think I'll go to Honolulu. I want to do the Honolulu Marathon. <laughs> Yeah, that's special because most people, I mean, that's unusual. Yeah, that's my mind, though. Yeah. Like, even like, oh, I hope somebody puts on a 500 mile race. Candace, you need to come up a with 500 a 500 mile. mile? She's going to. Not then, though. No, but this now. is like now. But now. Right. <laughs> but had you ever heard of ultras? Like, when did you first no, discover so, that world? So, the first year I ran two marathons, and the second year I decided I was going to run every marathon in California. Uh-huh. And this is mind you, not knowing anybody. And I actually. Yeah. Started running some of them were trail marathons because in, at the time in California, there was too many to run. I couldn't have run them all. But a lot of them were on trails. And I thought, oh, this is kind of interesting. There's, you know, these trails that we're running on. And it was a lot harder than running on a road marathon. You, the very first one I did, I was like, this is way harder. There was no water stop every mile. It was like the guy that put on the trail marathon that I did for my first one was in the Marin Headlands. And it was mm-hmm. like, Water every six miles, like out of a jug mm-hmm. and a box, a thing of cookies, which I couldn't eat. I mean, they weren't vegan. So I was like, oh my God, you know, and they, they told us in advance, you need to carry a water bottle. So I had to buy a waste thing. And uh-huh. So getting through my first trail mar- marathon, I met actually a guy that I was running with and he was doing all the marathons in California and he kind of became my mentor, this older gentleman. And he, so we were running a lot of the same ones together. He was much faster than me, but on the trails, I could kind of keep up with him, but road, he was faster. Yeah. And this is like 99, 90, no, this is in 97. 97 okay. Yeah. So yeah. then I started hearing people, I was at a, it was, and I remember this vividly. I was at a, uh, it was a marathon in Morgan Hill. And I heard this lady, Linda, who's actually a friend of mine now, but she was rambling on that she had run, because this is on a Sunday. She ran like a 50 mile or the day before. And I was like, fuck, 50 miles. She ran a 50 mile and she's running a marathon today. Uh-huh. Like, and she talks like she's mm-hmm. funny. Like I've known her all these years, but she was going on and on and on. I'm like, how could she even be talking? Like she's running this marathon today. So I heard her talking about that. And then I thought, I'm going to run a 50K. It's only six miles more. I mean, come on. I'm running trails. It sounds so much more impressive, though. (laughs) Yeah. So 
So I signed up. I found like a 50K. And actually, the very first 50K, let me back that up. So I called the race director because at the time, there you had to, it was in the back of like Runner's World or whatever. Mm-hmm. It, there was no email and all of that. So there was one in Fremont called Ohlone 50K. And this is, it has 9,000 feet of climbing in it. Right. And I was like, yeah, it's in Fremont. I'm going to run it because I live in Fremont, you know? And 9, I had never been up. Feet. I think I'd been up Mission Peak a couple of times at that point. A few times. And I knew it was hard, but I didn't know what was beyond that. Like, it was a point to point. So it went out to Del Val. And so I called up the race director and I said, Oh, I want to sign up for your 50K. And he goes, Have you run out there before? And I said, Well, I've been up Mission Peak and I'm doing marathons. He goes, Hmm. He goes, You know, it's really hard. It's really remote. And I said, Oh, yeah. And he goes, Well, he goes, How long have you been running for? And I said, A couple of years. And he goes, And you want this to be your first 50K? And I was like, Yeah, I want to. I've been up Mission Peak twice. And he goes, it's a lot harder than you think. Uh-huh. And he kind of scared me. And he goes, I suggest for you to run Skyline 50K. And that was an easier one at Lake Chabot. And I was like, okay, because he kind of scared me. And he was like n- pretty much telling me not to do it. So I was like, okay, I'll go run that one. So that was – and at the time, there was only like – I think there was maybe four 50Ks in the Bay Area. Uh-huh. Now I can't even tell you, hundreds. Right. And this is just in the Bay Area where I lived. I mean, the, the, that whole scene had been around for – probably a couple decades, but yeah, it was, it was still small. very much this micro subculture. It was. People sleeping in tents the night before yep. <laughs> and, and just small groups of people. It was hardly what we think of. Oh it yeah. Everything's a lottery now. and sells out yeah. now. I mean, yeah, the yeah. Loney sells out. So I decided then, okay, I'll do this 50 K. So I did the one at Lake Chabot. And at that point I had already run, I did this two 15 mile loop course. It wasn't part of the course. I mean, some of the miles was, but I wanted to feel confident that I could run 30 miles. So I did 30 miles before even the race yeah. came. And that was at a slower pace. I mean, race day, you're always pushing harder, you know, cause you're wanting to get ahead of people and you know, you have nobody to push you when you're by yourself training and you're just kind of dilly dallying. So I showed up, it was 105 degrees that day, super hot. I was not used to like walking like hills and I'm seeing all these people like right off the bat once we get off the road part it was a steep hill and they're all walking and I'm thinking what the heck are they walking and people are like you should probably walk right now you know and it's there's lots of hills and is this your first ultra and I'm like yeah but I don't need to walk right so all those people later on of course passed me and they're Mm -hmm. like see you should have been walking my legs I mean it was so hot I didn't know about hydration didn't, you know, wasn't drinking right, wasn't eating correctly, knew nothing. And I was just like, by the time I got to like, I think 27 miles, I was like, oh my God, like in a bad way. I'm like, mm-hmm. am I going to even make it? Like I was scared I wasn't going to make it to the finish because my legs were so tight and just like, you know, dehydrated. And so, but I made it and I finished and I was like, oh my God, that was so hard. And then I was like, well, I'm going to do a 50 miler. Uh-huh. <laughs> so it just, and at that time, ultra running magazine was the magazine. So you got, I got a copy at the finish of the 50 K. So I didn't know anything about this magazine until I finished. And that's where it opened up. It was like all these races. There's Here's where the races world. are. This is my Bible to see where I'm going to go next. So I signed up for a 50 miler and then I did another 50 K and this is all within a four month period. And I got through this 50 mile race that was, in Napa, and it was pouring rain, like horrible, horrible. I never ran in conditions like that. And they actually allowed you to drop to the 50K if you wanted to, and you were in the 50 miler. Uh And I stuck it out. I said, nope, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to finish this, and then I'm going to run a 100 miler. So in the middle of it, I was just like, oh my God, what am I doing? If I can get through this, that means I'm tough enough and I can do this 100 miles. Yeah. So I got through the finish and then decided to run a 100 mile race. And what are you learning about yourself along the way? Like, what is running doing for you? So I'm learning that I am, I I never looked at myself as being super strong or, you know, confident. I was always, you know, a little bit, uh, I'm not so confident on what, if I can do it or if I can't. But my confidence was building and I was feeling like I can do whatever I set my mind to. And it took me a long time to learn that in life. Like, I always would put up blocks and put up doors and walls in front of me and not... You know, just think I couldn't do it, you right. know. 
and then being able to... And then not taking that risk. It's yes. like, well, you're never really putting yourself on the line. Exactly. And so, and I remember, I'm going to backtrack to, me and my dad were watching when, you know, way back in the day, they used to have Western States on Wild World of Sports. Did and they? My, yes. I didn't know that. Mm-hmm. And wow. so my dad, he was a runner and he was like, come watch this. And he goes, there's these people running from Squaw Valley. And I knew where Squaw Valley and Auburn were because we used to go play yeah. soccer in Auburn and we'd go to Squaw Valley to ski once in a while or go to the snow. And he goes, they're running from Squaw Valley to Auburn. And I was like, yeah, you know, I was like 12 or 14 at the time. And I was like, okay, I sat down and I was like, okay. You know, I wasn't interested, but I remember that. I remember him talking about this Western Mm. States and he was a runner. Like I said, he had did a marathon and I was like, hmm, whatever, you know, and that that was my thing. Okay. I'm going to go give me some money. I'm going to go to the store now. Right. But it it was lodged in the back of your unconscious mind. When I started running. After I did that marathon and then I did my 50K, I was like, I got to do this 100 miler. Like my dad, if he was mm-hmm. alive, he'd be right here helping me get do this thing. And, and you know, I, I had heard what a 100 miler was vaguely just through that one chance, you know, on the TV. And so I was like, I'm going to do this. So I didn't know anything or anybody that ran. And, and Harry had already did my few 50, 50, two 50Ks or 150K and two 50 milers. And show up at the 100-mile race, knew nothing, didn't even have a light. Yeah. So me and, at the time, my boyfriend Kevin, I'm like, shit, i got to go to Walmart or wherever to get a light. I need these lights for nighttime. I wasn't even thinking. That's how, like, clueless. Right. Clueless I was. And no nighttime running. And I was like, okay. And at the time, I got bike lights. And they had, like, the bigger batteries. It was diesel batteries. So uh-huh. I'm showing up and, you know, getting all this new stuff to use and, at the time, I was eating a lot of baby food because it was easy to digest when I was mm-hmm. doing ultras. And I thought, I read up, somebody ate baby food. I'm going to put baby food in my drop bags and jars of almond butter or whatever. At the time, they didn't have a squeezy packets of baby foods. <laughs> it was right. glass like jars. Just the cans of it. Right. They were jars. The jars. And they were broken in my, pa- my uh. drop bags. <laughs> yeah, because they're not very gentle with drop bags. So that's what I used as fuel. There was, I had, think I had gel at the time. There was a couple of gel companies, but I, in Cliff Bar, and that was it. And I. For the whole time. Yeah, I didn't know the right nutrition. I hadn't met anybody doing these hundreds and 50 milers really to be able to figure this out. Well, it's, the trajectory is pretty traditional. Like, okay, 10K, marathon, 50K, 50 miler. And then it's like, okay, 100 miler. Like the jump from 50 miler to 100 miler. It's big. Like people think of those as being kind of in the same world, but those are, I mean, you're doubling the distance. You are. You know, it's like, it's a crazy leap. And it's a very different thing doing 100 versus a 50. That's what, I mean, back then there wasn't a lot of 100Ks. So there there are 100Ks around, but back then there was like maybe four to five in Mm -hmm. the United States. So you had to go that leap. That was your leap. There was no like in between like they do now. And what is, tell me the difference. It's a big difference. I mean, past 50 miles, then you're like dealing with going into the night. If you haven't trained at night, you're going into like you know, hallucinations. I mean, not sleeping, trying to keep yourself awake. It's a whole nother, you're stumbling around and knowing when to walk yeah, and when to and take breaks. I was like, so I was so out of it back then. I wouldn't even, I wasn't even doing coffee back then. I thought that was a drug. So, uh-huh. so in the middle of the night, I'm stumbling around and this lady comes up on me. She goes, are you okay? And I said, no, I'm tired. And I said, I, I said, I hope there's coffee at the next aid station. I was going to willing to have coffee. And she goes, Okay, she goes. I don't think they have it here. And she goes, you need to take a, like a caffeine pill. And I'm like, what's that? She goes, it's just like coffee. And I'm like, no, that's like a drug. That's like yeah. speed. And she goes, no, it's just like it's 200 milligrams of caffeine. So this, me and her were going on and on, and we were walking together. Her name was Kim, and we got to the aid station, and they actually had no coffee. And I was like, oh my god, how am I going to do this? And I was like, bad, falling asleep. Like I, I didn't know how I was going to get even around this. But this was like mile, I was going into mile 80 loop, 80 to 100. No, I was at mile 60. So I was already going into getting to 80 and I could not stay awake. So she convinced me to take this caffeine pill and she goes, break it in half. If you're that freaked out about this, she goes, you really need to take it. You're not going to make it. And she was right. I took this caffeine pill, 100 milligrams. And all of a sudden I was like, wow, I'm like awake. Yeah. And I didn't do coffee back then. So, so you're tall. Yeah. So I, it, it definitely helped me. That saved me. I probably would have never been able to finish. I mean, I was so out of it. And just taking that little bit of caffeine 
got me through that through that night, uh-huh. you know, and and I was like, okay, it's not that bad, but it was years before then that I even did coffee. I didn't start drinking coffee until like 2004. Yeah, you don't seem like you need it. No, I right. had some today. Though. Yeah, okay, <laughs> I do uh, like my espresso. <laughs> do you have have you DNF'd a bunch of oh, races? Yeah. Yeah. You do that with you know. <clears throat> that's how you learn. I mean, you a lot. race all the time. You have a like. <laughs> you're just constantly like it's just been a constant stream of you racing ever since, right? Like a lot, yeah. yeah. Like after this, doing these three two hundreds, I'm just like I don't want to do anything. But I have a hundred miler coming up, uh-huh. like next weekend. <laughs> and do you treat every race the same, or do you try to peak for certain races or prioritize certain events? Well, obviously with the two hundreds, you were just I was just like there was no training. I was like you know you're racing and then going for it. And that's a different kind of race. You're, yeah. you know, you're taking it a lot slower to be able to survive and then push yourself later on when you I can. I would think in between, the most important thing is making sure Recovery. you're healthy and totally Yeah, and trying rested. to gain weight back up. Because yeah. I, like, with, I started, I think I was like 113, 114 at the beginning of the race season. I mean, I always get down to about 109, 110 if I'm doing lots of races. But I got down to like 103, 104 and was constantly trying to add, you know, calories. Like, I mean, like jars of almond butter and uh-huh. everything else. I'm like eating vegan ice cream, which I never hardly eat, but I know I'm needing calories. And so I'm like buying one for me and one for my boyfriend. And my boyfriend's like, somehow <laughs> this is not going right. Uh-huh. <laughs> You're not gaining weight and I'm gaining weight. So, but just eating a ton of healthy and lots more calories, like I said, adding more nuts and high calorie stuff every day just to gain that weight. So, you know, you're going to lose it when you're back into the game. And a typical training week is what, like uh, 80 to 120 mm-hmm. miles? Yeah. In mm-hmm. the summers, I'm definitely up there. Right. I mean, some this year I, Twi- I had running some twice three, a day or long? Nope, just like once a day. Once and a day. some of my runs, I mean, I had some 300 and something mile weeks this year. And do you work with a coach or do nope. you design your own, just do what just you feel? Just do my or, thing, yeah. Uh-huh. I like training. And my whole thing is I love just being outdoors and being in the wilderness and you know, I was fast at one time. I'm not ever going to be as fast as I can, you know, I guess if I had a coach. But I I run because I love it. I, I don't that's want to be fast. That's the thing that I get. Like, you just like being at these out. races, and you like being part and of the community. And that's when I push myself and... when I'm in a race. I'm like, training for me is just enjoying the earth and seeing what I can see because, you know, I've been given a gift. I feel like it's a gift to be able to do this because I'm no different than anybody else. Mm-hmm. And it's like, I just happen to have this love for being outdoors now and that's you know seeing things every day I don't want to miss anything you know because yeah. one day I'm not going to be here or I can't do it and I know that time can come I could hurt myself I could something could happen where I can't run again and so I'm enjoying it now uh-huh. you injury know? free you've never had any Luckily, big time yeah, injuries just like minor stuff like PF here and there my, I've always had a hamstring thing and I hurt that in CrossFit years ago and it just comes and goes and I you know, I have recovery pump boots and I go to, you know, get massages and so Epsom salt baths. So I'm constantly doing stuff that helps uh-huh. me. Massages, yes. acupuncture. Do you have any, ever you know, had any back issues or anything no, like that? No, uh-uh. Yeah. No, I'm starting to get more of like a shoulder thing just from with your head down and you're in the uh-huh. 200s and you're falling. You know, it's I notice it the older I get and the longer I go, it, it bothers me. Yeah. So now I don't even try to carry the water bottles in my hands in the 200s because I'm using tracking poles anyways. I put the water up here I'm with my best. hydration. And I find that that actually helps me when I'm using the trekking poles in the 200-mile race. I usually don't grab onto them until about 50 miles in. But they give you something to do, and then you're working your other muscles, so you're not, like, eh, hunched and, over. And outside the running, what kind of cross-training do you do? I do. I lift weights, so I do kettlebells, box jumps, kind of, like, Cross-fitty. modified CrossFit stuff, yeah, mm-hmm. but on my own. And so in Bishop, I haven't been working out, I mean, in a gym for two months, and I used to go to 24-Hour Fitness or whatever, and I'm like, I don't have a lot of options at Bishop, but I found that they have a CrossFit that actually is open 24-7, and they have other stuff in there. You can use the – they have great treadmills and rowing. Mm-hmm machines and weights that you can use so you don't have to just do crossfit and that's kind of what right i'm going to join that so so you show up on the pages of born to run i would mm. imagine that kind of changed your life a little bit i mean that book was such a big deal it was a big right? deal <laughs> and they've still they've been trying to make a movie out of that forever yeah, i don't know if that's ever going to happen but yeah. <laughs> uh, there were a couple so moments process. where it looked like it might have might it looked like it was going to go peter sarsgaard was yeah. i don't know but i don't know what happened but um but so many people read that book and and that was really an entry point for most people's 
unless you read Dean Karnaz's book, yeah. I mean, this was an entry point for people to discover what this whole ultra running sure. world was all about. Mm-hmm. And you were this crazy colorful figure <laughs> in this book. I yeah. mean, so what was that like for you and how did that change, you know, what would happen to you when you would show up at these races or just how you were living your life? I, I would meet a lot of people because people were not runners and then they became runners because of this right. book. It was so like many so people. many people that they may have been 10 K runners or not runners at all. And then they read this and they had this whole thing where they wanted to get into this barefoot running and this right. barefoot whole thing Ted. that kind of went away. Yeah. And, but that kind of is not the thing, but they were all minimalist getting into it. And I'm uh-huh. like, yeah, I don't, you know, people were coming up to me and they were like, you're that girl in the book. And I'm like, yep, that's me. And I'm or trying the- to remember, because you went down for the race with the Tara Hamara in the Copper no, Canyon. Uh-uh. No, no, okay. this is all, I was at Badwater when he was writing uh, the whole okay. Badwater I, stuff. Right, right, right. Yeah, remember, and that's it's when been I, so long since I wrote Yeah, he's it. all, do you mind if I write about your yeah. yo-yo? And I'm like, no, go ahead. Uh-huh. <laughs> So you did the yo-yo. Did you did you ever get tempted to do the double bad water? No, I did bad water. So everybody assumed I did bad water a bunch of times. I uh-huh. only did, did it, it last year. Yeah, oh, last year. Oh, just last year. <laughs> so my oh, boyfriend wow. has done it three times, and I've crewed there a bunch. Uh-huh. And I always told Chris, the race director, I, I I'm not going to run That's it. Awesome. I don't run on the ri- road. I'm not a road runner. I'm not a road runner. And he'd always see me doing like flatter stuff, and he'd be like, uh, wait, you just did this, or you just did that, and he was always trying to encourage me to uh-huh. do it, and then I was like, no, 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 and then finally I was like, guess what, I'm going to do it, so I did uh, his whole series, so he has the Cape Fair, which is the 50-mile mm-hmm. and the desert in, or not desert, on the beach in North Carolina, and then I did the Salton Sea, which is a team race, and mm-hmm. then did Badwater, right. so it's called the Ultra Cup. So right. I did that last year. And Badwater is back to its original course, yeah. right? Yeah, they only one year did they not have it, right. but they, ha- they lost the their start license time. to do. The, the yeah, start time is different. They don't start in the morning right. like they used to. Yeah, they start right. at night, which is great. It's much better. I think it's much easier because yeah. I've crewed when it used to be the old time, and it's much harder. Oh yeah, I crewed. Much I crewed for Dean there a couple of years ago, and at like two in the afternoon, you're like, "What is happening?" <laughs> It's so but we're all trained for it. Yeah. So, like, when you're training, uh-huh. you know, even when I've crewed there, I've always trained, uh-huh. you know, ready for it. But when I got in, I definitely trained, like, you know, full on clothing out in the heat of the day. And I had no problems. It was fine no for you. No problems. Yeah, I want yeah. to go back because I think I could push harder. So, did, I'm your, did do your souls sure. melt in that whole none thing? None of that. No. None of that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, do you know Shannon Farrar Griefer? Yes, of course yeah, I do. She lives she's, here. I see her. I know, around and the she's probably going to be mad that I'm here and I'm not oh, really? stopping by and seeing her. You should see her. She's a kick. I know, but I don't have time. She's amazing. <laughs> yeah, what she's she been is. able to do. And, of course. And, you know, she's, she's battling Me and some her, health challenges that, at the I mean, time. we've known you, each other for the same back, amount of right? time. Yeah, yeah we she met goes at a 24 hour race, and it was the same year she did her first 100 miler. We know each other. Yeah, I've spent a lot of time with her. She's supposed to be at Havelina this weekend, but she's. Something she with her knee. keeps showing up. Um, you guys are the OGs. Yeah. You know, going <laughs> way back. Uh-huh. So now when you show up, you're like a celebrity at these races. Yeah, it's interesting, but it's great. I mean, with the book, it's like so many people are coming up to me just saying how it touched them or inspired them and emails uh-huh. all the time. And, you know, and that's why I keep going. It's like, you know, women are like, oh, I'm too old to do. It's like, no, you're my age. Why right. are you too old to do this? You're not too old to do anything. It's like you can do anything you want at any age. And a lot of women are just starting to run in their 50s. Mm -hmm. So it's like it gives them somebody to look at. And you've been doing this for a long time. And some of your biggest accomplishments are recent. Yeah. You know? I've always done crazy stuff. I know. And the book came out in March, May? Like the spring, right? Yeah, Yeah, Mm -hmm. May. Uh, Reborn on the Run. Yeah. So tell, I haven't read the book yet, but tell me. I mean, we're talking about all the stuff that I know is in the book. Yeah. I mean, it's an autobiography. But what inspired you to write a book about all of this? I have so many stories. So, like, I'd be out on runs with people, and they're like, why don't you write a book? Why don't you write a book? And it was a constant thing. And so a literary agent from uh, New York, Carol Mann Agency, contacted me, and they said, have you thought of writing a book? And I said, yeah, but I don't have time to write a book. I could record a book and uh-huh. then somebody can put it on paper for me. I, I'm busy running all the time. So they said, well, we can help you do this. And so I said, all right. And say so this guy, Dan had written an article about me and I really liked the style. He came and followed me. He did all this research on me. Mm-hmm. And so he knew me really well. And I said, well, do I have to use one of your writers or can we use somebody else? And she said, well, you certainly can hire somebody else. You can hire somebody she goes, but uh, tell me who you want, and I'll contact them and have a chat with them. And so I said, 
here's the person and here's his contact. And they contacted him and then he got back to me and I, he goes, yeah, he goes, I've never written a book. He goes, I write, he writes for a newspaper and he's great at interviewing. So we decided that we would collaborate and we would work together and he'd be my writer. So we figured out the way we were going to do it. I was going to record my stories. We came up with like the format of the book Uh and then we would record like stories, like the chapters. And so in the beginning, we kind of started and we sent it, sent some of it out. And they're like, no, this is like an interview. (laughs) You guys are like interviewing each other back and forth. So he was like, you got to really flesh detail out. So I would go out on these runs and record, you know, run, walk and record my whole story that I was talking about. And and I would have to go back, and I would even stop on the trail and just sit down and close my eyes when I was, you know, recording my chapter, just remembering in full detail things. And so that's how we did it. I recorded it, yeah. basically, and we, you know, by chapter by chapter. Yeah. And it was a lot of work. It wasn't uh-huh. easy. Uh-huh. And so that's how we did it. That's cool. So it was really cool, yeah. So you, uh, so congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, it's no small thing. Yeah. Um, so you've been kind of touring around. Yeah, the book doing book signings thing. and, you know, a lot of my races, I'm just doing book signings. I'm, mm-hmm. you know, in different, like, I'm going to be in San Diego in December at Running Skirts to do a thing with them. And I did a bunch of the REIs in the Bay Area. So yeah. I'm waiting until after the new year to start doing more stuff because it's like I'm, after all the running, <laughs> just yeah. doing all those races. I'm like, I just want to have me time and be on the trail all by myself. Yeah. It's a weird thing. Like, your, your story is so different than mine, but like... I'm into ultras. I'm in recovery. I I'm vegan. You know, like what is it about? I mean, I need to get some tattoos. I guess but like, you have a I lot of tattoos. <laughs> That's my next venture, I suppose. Awesome. But what do you think it is about like those three things that? I mean, there's so many. Like, there's a lot of vegans in the ultra world. Like, there's I feel like a lot That's more the now. sport that really launched the idea that you could be an athlete and be vegan. Now well, you're seeing athletes in all different disciplines, but exactly. it kind of started in this ultra world. Maybe that's because of Scott Jurek. I don't yeah. know. But. And I was around before him. Right. So, but no, but you know, I wasn't fast or, you know, and that he got us on the map, you know, yeah. for the vegans. And, you know, like I said, I'd been vegan for a long time and it shows you, look, I'm not, I didn't waste away. I'm still going. Um, I'm getting enough protein. I've been, I've I mean, you're 53 with, and you yeah. just ran three 200 mile plus races in a period of 10 weeks. Yeah. And it's I'm insane. vegan. And so what? We can't do anything. <laughs> yeah. And you look amazing. So yeah. it's all working fine. Yeah. And, and I'm so happy with the, you know, with the social media showing these other athletes, like you see these even raw vegan bodybuilders and uh-huh. it's like, no, why do you have to eat meat? Look at this guy. He, you look at him and obviously they know what they're doing. You're, you're getting the right amount of calories and food and building your body from there. Mm-hmm. So it's not, yeah, it's sad. I wish everybody could kind of get on board. Well, it's and changing, you know, it's growing and, you know, yeah. awareness. And I think social media has played a big part in Which that. Which is really good, you know, with um, documentaries and stuff and yeah. that's changing. And people get angry, but then there, there's a conversation that's happening. Exactly. You know? So there's a, there's a debate that's often healthy, sometimes not healthy. Yeah. And I think well. a lot of times but, when people are like overweight, they're like, oh, I don't want it. That's not good for you. It's because they're afraid, you know, they're, they have to face their self. And I, it was funny because I was running with a, a, a guy at the race and he was like, most men that become vegan, they were overweight or something. And then they watch a documentary and then they get back in, you know, they mm-hmm. get into this. It's like more women tend to be going into the veganism, but guys are like meat and, you know, you're supposed to be the hunter kind of thing. And and they, yeah, well, there's different the entry way. points for different people. Yeah. You know, I think a lot of guys, yeah, they reach middle age and they feel <laughs> lousy and they're overweight. I mean, that's my story. Yeah, and yeah, then I'm like, yeah. I need to do something different. And now, 12 years later, it's like about the environment. And exactly. it's about, you know, factory farming. And it's about well, you ethics learn that, and, and it's all great these that things you're that doing it as I didn't a diet. care about. Exactly. And actually were a turnoff at that time. Like, yeah. A lot of it is timing. People have to be in the right place in their life at the right time in order to, to receive a certain it, yeah. message. You know, I certainly would not have been able to hear it. You know, a year prior to yeah. where I was, and so, you know, I think um, everybody has a role in how they advocate. You know, these lifestyle choices, and I think they're all appropriate because people are tuning into different frequencies. Yep, I agree with you. A lot of people start as a diet, and then their their mindset. They're like, wait, and it goes a little further. And then you're more conscious of what's going on in the environment Mm -hmm. and they start just using it as a diet, not really as a lifestyle because it is a lifestyle change. But then it expands. You got, you, you, you know, it's like you ran a 10 K and now 
you're the ultra queen, you're the dirt diva. <laughs> what does the dirt diva mean? What is that? So what that is, where does that come from? So we've had uh-huh. the Pacific Crest trail. All right, because right, then explain how in ultras you, you get these nicknames. Well, that, that that's not from ultras. That's from, oh, this is not. from fast okay. packing and hiking. So, uh-huh. so when you're doing like the Appalachian Trail, Pacific Crest Trail, Continental Divide, all long distance hikers, they don't use their real name. You become somebody else. When Why you're is living that? In, it's just the thing. It's a tradition. So I wasn't even doing a long trail. I was doing the yo yo and the JMT, and I met a guy that was hiking the Pacific Crest Trail. And I came running up the trail, and he was like, oh, you know, it's filthy. It was like on my turnaround. And he goes, you look like a diva. You know, it was like colorful, and but filthy. I hadn't showered in days. You know, I'm going on like 10 days. And he goes, you look like a dirty diva. And I was like, what? Uh-huh. <laughs> and he goes, do you have a trail name? And I said, no. He goes, dirty diva. And I said, I don't like that. And he goes, Dirt Diva. And I go, oh, I like that. And so then we started talking, and he gave me his trail name, and he told me he's like the Pacific Crest Trail. And I was like, yeah, I want to do that one day. And so that kind of stuck. So I used that as my trail name because he gave it to me. Uh-huh. So that's kind of how it stuck. And you've always had the flair for the color and all that. I, I mean, love it's like color. For people that are just listening to this on audio, it's like you've got, I don't know how many colors in your hair right now. You're wearing like Six. super cool <laughs> clothes. And you're known for... Showing up these races, and you and always have outfits, these yeah. these like amazing outfits. Usually, run in a skirt. Yeah, like always. There's like 800 always. colors to yep. you, and rainbows, and all kinds Rainbow of things right. going on. <laughs> I love it. You should it. have your own full line of your gear. I do. I, w- you I do? would love to. No, yeah. I am sponsored by people, but uh-huh. <laughs> I would love to make my own. So. They should. Well, whoever's sponsoring you should let you design I would, a line. I, know. I agree. Yeah. If they're listening. <laughs> yeah. Well, they're listening. Yeah, I just love color. Color brings joy and mm-hmm. happiness, I think. And I was in such a dark place for so long. And even people in races, they said, if you can just stay there and run right in front of me this whole race, I'm going to finish because I'm going to be feeling good and happy. Because, uh-huh. you, you know, just seeing you in a race, people will say that. You came up at the right time. I was like feeling sad and you are just, you look happy. You're just happiness, the color. Yeah. You're always jumping up and down yeah. and smiling and, and like, does it, but you must have your dark moments. Oh, of course. Right. <laughs> During the I races get, yeah, and, and you life know, in you, general. I was telling somebody in the 200, I'm like, fuck, like maybe a mountain lion will bite my leg and I'll have to stop. So I don't have to quit, like make an excuse to stop. I'm like, yeah. just maybe something will happen and I have to save somebody's life and I'll be able to stop the race. I mean, you go, your mind is like, wacko out there, you know, and that's what I think. But then I go, no, knock it off. You know, just yeah. keep going. Don't think that. So I always try to change that. But there's those points when you're like, I got to be out here three more days, three days with no more sleep, you know, sleeping here or there. It's freezing out. I was wearing two pairs of pants at the last race, mm. a polar tech shirt, two puffy jackets, two with hoods over my head, with a hat, with two pairs of gloves and hand warmers. This is that's, at Moab? That's how cold. And I'm at oh. the thing up over my face. That is how cold I was at night. And I was just okay if I kept moving. Like, if I had to stop, it would have been way, it would have been a bad thing. Cold. Mm-hmm. Would have, like, it was that bad. Snow. But I cold. feel like your thing is you're having fun all the time. Like, you're yeah. doing this for fun. You're not here like, I'm going to beat these people and I'm going to yeah. be on a podium. Like, you're there for the ride. I'm there to inspire other people. That's what I, I would say. You know, it's like... We need more people to inspire other people. And I mean, people are inspired by really fast people, but just me, I'm average and just been doing it and just do crazy things because I say I want to do something and I make but it But you're not, a, you know, you're not average, <laughs> right? Well, I guess not. You've done things no one's, no one's done and you've, yeah, you have plenty of victories and all of that. Wanted to. But it's funny because you like, you've won races and you've yeah, done things that no one has ever done before, but you're also like, you can be a middle of the packer person yep. as well and be there with, you know, all kinds of people who Yeah, and I don't mind as long as I finish. I, if I finished yeah. in last, I don't care. As long as they finish. And to me, I always look at that person. They were, you know, the last place people were like 12 hours behind me at Moab. But it's like, those are the people. They're out there a long time. And so they get through it too. So it's all up here that's pushing. It's harder. Because it imagine is. being out there for like a full day long. No, it's I like <laughs> you see that at, you see that at Badwater. Yeah. You know, like you finish and then you go back down the mountain and you're in the hotel and then you go to dinner and then you go to sleep yeah, and, and you wake up the next morning and people are still coming <laughs> in. You know? It's like unbelievable. It's true. Yeah. And that takes an extra level of like tenacity and focus and you know I don't know it's 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 inspiring. It's, it is. Well, you, you know? look at Shannon. I mean, one year yeah. she like I was like, is she even gonna make it? Like. Two years ago, it was like questionable, mm-hmm. and it was like, dang, you know, it was like two or three years ago when she finished last, and she yeah. made it. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. like, Amazing. wow, yeah. Amazing. So you've been 
in this game for a long time and the whole subculture and world of, of ultras has changed so dramatically. I would imagine there's a hardcore group of people who lament these changes and want it to <laughs> the be the way that guys. it was. <laughs> yeah. Like go back to the tent and all of that. Um, and yet uh, now it's become, I don't know if it's fair to say mass participatory, but yeah, the number of so numbers known. of people, like people there's that are so many races. Runners know of an ultra. Yeah, and and more and more people are doing it. So how mm-hmm. do you think about that growth? I, I like it. Mm-hmm. I, you know, a lot of the old school guys are. I, I was talking to somebody last week at the race, and he was like, "Wow, well, too many people. That's why I'm running the 200s." Well, yeah, if you want to be in a race where there's less people, you do the 200s. That's uh-huh. more on the edge now. That's the French people. <laughs> how many people are showing up at the 200s? So, let's see. That race had 100 and I want to say like 180, 100. It did sell. Tahoe sold out. Uh Tahoe was like 200 and something. It sold out. And how many people DNF? It's a high finishing rate. All the 200s, 80% finishing rate. How are they vetting people for that? Or why do you think that is? Because you get more time. The cutoffs are not tight Mm. because she's allowing for sleep in the race. So it's not a stage race, but it's like a stage race because right. it's a continuous clock running. And there is plenty of time. So like the earlier cutoffs, uh, well, this race, it just seemed like because it's longer that, the you know, you get more extended. But I think the first cutoff at mile 30 or no, it was like 20. You Because it's so remote, she can't, doesn't have a lot of cutoffs in between because you can't get the people yeah. out of there. So you just keep going. But the, the first cutoff, you had to get to 20 miles, you had 13 hours. Mm-hmm. Which is right. totally doable. Right, right, right. She makes it so it's like two and a half miles an hour mm. to three. And that allows for sleep. So you could sleep every day for five hours if you wanted. Right. And still finish. That would be like at the back of the packers right. doing it. So And what just, does the sleep look like at the front of the pack? Uh, like well, Courtney. Courtney nothing. She takes Zero. like two hour nap breaks on two minute nap breaks on the trail. Two minutes. So she that she was telling me that at Tahoe. I go, How much did you sleep? Because I go, I only got two hours sleep and I still took uh 90 hours to finish, you know, because I was uh-huh. wobbling and just sitting down a lot at the aid stations and eating and just like trying to get myself to go because I wanted to sleep, but I couldn't. And she goes, oh, I probably slept about, I think she said 12 minutes total. <laughs> 12, so like six two-minute naps or something like that. It's unbelievable. I'm like, what? Yeah, that's super handy. <laughs> and I go, I had two hours, which was not enough. I tried to uh-huh. have five hours total in a 200. In the first two of the Triple Crown, I only got two hours in, and it mm. was the hallucinations were yeah. out of control. What are you seeing when you're hallucinating? <sighs> Everything's a something. A tree is people. You know, it's just like a stick as a snake, and it's like— Is it, is it happening during the day, too, or only at night? Mm. You see it in the day, but mostly at night. And then you hear, I was getting audio stuff, and it was like, huh? Nobody's around. There's people around me. No, they're not here. And at the end, it was just like everything was at the end of Bigfoot. That was the first time where I didn't get at least three, four, or five hours sleep Uh in a race. And the walls were like, every rock was a painting. Like somebody came out and like, I was like, wow, these people came out in this little town and they painted each rock with like a, picture a mural i was like this is really cool and i would just be stumbling and falling asleep on my feet and so at the end i told my boyfriend he paced me in and i said did you see that like killer rock wall and he's like what because there was no rock he goes there was Uh a rock wall i go no there was like all the the paintings on it and he goes there's no paintings i said tomorrow you need to drive me back over there Uh and we get there the next day and i'm like (laughs) nothing on there i saw Uh all these really cool paintings yeah and at Tahoe, the, I kept, so Truman was crewing. He was on the crew at Tahoe with my pacers. And at the end, I was so out of it. I kept stopping, and I would stop at a bush and start petting it. And I was like, ah, oh, it's Truman. And then I'm like, fuck, what am I doing? And I'd snap it's out of bush. it, like, knowing that, what are you doing? You're wandering to these bushes, petting bushes. Oh and my, my pacer was in front of me, and she calls me sister. She's from Mexico. My friend Gabby, I paced her at Badwater this year. And she goes, sister, what are you doing? And I'm like, nothing. And she's like, okay, I keep coming. And then at Badwater, she had hallucinations, and we had to push her hard because she barely, she was nearly cut off. And she kept saying, I see a Chinaman in a Chinese pointy hat. And so I kept going to the bushes. And at one point, she goes, what are you doing, sister? And I said, I don't see a Chinaman with a Chinese hat. Yeah. <laughs> she laughed. She goes, you're hallucinating. Somebody should do a book of like of the halluc- all, the, all the hallucinations. They you know? should, after, it's especially like a after weird Bigfoot. look into somebody's collective unconscious I mean, after, mind. Uh, you know? Moab, everybody has like really? a story. 
crazy yeah. stories. Like I saw sculptures of mountain lions out there out of the snow. I mean, it was just crazy. The people it that can't be good for you. Well, no. And the, one of the women that was like, I think she was in like second or third van and she was doing the triple crown too, Vaughn. And she had like major hallucinations where she laid down and stopped and everything was moving. She was in, trapped in this other world. She said it, it the race director had to come find her because we're all wearing spot devices. Uh-huh. In order to send a search and rescue out, they couldn't get to us in time. And so the race director, Candace, she always heads up a team like, okay, we know that's fun, and she hasn't moved for seven hours. We got, mm. I got to go to her. I got to find mm. out what's going on. And so she went out to her, and she was said she was trapped. She couldn't get going. She was in, like, this another world. She was so out of it, and she hadn't slept. Wow. So, yeah, that's why I try to sleep a little bit because I don't want to be there. I've gotten no, there. I can't so, be good. I would imagine it pays dividend if you can force yourself to sleep. Yeah, it the d- way that you, you try feel, to, but she sleeps on trail it. is what she does. And what happened is she went to lay down on the trail, and she sat her light down, and she couldn't find it in her gloves, and it was freezing out there. So she couldn't move. She, just, she would see headlights go by, and she was trying to say stuff and couldn't get it out to people. Yeah. Like, they were not that far away from her, but nobody saw her because it was dark. Right. So, wow. Yeah, it's craziness. So what's driving all of this? Like, what, is it, what, what keeps you in it? Like, you've done hundreds of these things. Like, why are, how are you still enthusiastic about it? What are you trying to learn about yourself or prove to yourself? Challenge. Or is it just... I just want to keep challenging myself as long as I can because I, I know I'm only here for this one time in my life. And it's like, I just enjoy being out there. I just enjoy the whole thing and the people you meet along the way. It's like you're a family, especially in the 200s. You got to help each other. You connect. If you don't have pacers or crew at night, you're like hooking up with another runner for safety purposes. Just keeping each other motivated and you learn everybody's story out there. It's like we all have a story and it's really cool to share these things. What do you think people don't understand about hundreds and 200s and these crazy ultra races? They just think it's way too far and that people can't do that. That's just like, you know, it's unheard of. They don't believe that we can do this. And they just think they we're think nuts. They think you're lying? Or? Yeah, they just think we're nuts. <laughs> uh-huh. You know, and, and it's getting more common, especially now with the hundreds. 200s are still a bit out there. Yeah. But I'm trying to bring everybody in. Anybody can do a 200. It's easier than 100. Anybody can do a 200. I swear to God, it's easier than 100. And this is why. Because it's a trek. You get so right? much time. Yeah. yeah. So you get so much more time to finish. And it's doable. And that's why the finishing rate is high. You could push yourself, you know, first one, go out and see how you do, but it's a matter of managing your sleep and managing your fuel because you're alone out there mm-hmm. and you got to be taking care of yourself. So you can't have a problem. You, you got 20 miles and could take 10 hours to get into the next aid station. You better be damn well ready to take care of yourself. Yeah. I think people would be surprised uh, at at the sort of type of person that shows up at these races because I think if you don't know better – you imagine or you project this image of this super athlete and there are certainly yeah. those kinds of people but in my experience a lot of the people you're like whoa like you he, they just look like average, ev- average everyday pe- they don't they don't even necessarily look athletic like i just did <laughs> a podcast with this guy Sanjay Rawal who made this documentary about um, the 3100 self transcendence run. Oh, yeah, you know about yeah. this, where yes, they go around course. the half mile yep, block yep. in Queens. <laughs> That's like, nuts. <laughs> yeah, there's like 30 of, I don't know how, 25 of them or whatever yep. every year. Um, and they literally <laughs> run from 6 a.m. to midnight every yep. day for like 52 days in a row until they've, whoever gets to 3100 miles first wins, literally around a city block. I like know. the most boring. And then they switch directions each day or something like that. Uh, and you look at these people and you're like, you would never think. Like they could do that, something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they do. And it makes you, it really reframes how you think about sport and performance and extraordinary accomplishments. Yeah, because you think it's, it's a mind thing. Like there, mm. you have to have a strong mind to do a lot of this. And how have you trained your mind? Like what is, what is your relationship with your mind? Because it, it is so mental. It is. Like how have you gotten to this place where you can push through and do these Positive things? Positive thinking and thinking of others that are not here or people that are injured or wanting to change places. You know, there's people out there that are sick, that have cancer. People I know, they, they would they would trade in an instant to go out and do the triple crown and have me have their cancer. You know what I mean? It's like you got to do it for other people and – and, you know, sh- just do it for everybody that can't. Mm-hmm. And that's my big thing. So do you take 
like a uh, you have like a mental image of an individual like when you hit that breaking point and you don't want to keep going a like what times, gets you through yeah a lot of times i run for people and a friend dennis o'connor just passed away and i saw him recently at tahoe and he was out on a training run i believe he was in france or the alps somewhere just out on business and he was out on a run and there was i guess a storm i don't know the full thing you know i just from what i read online and he fell and he broke his arm and he didn't have a spot device, but he had his phone and he was able to send like a message. Uh-huh. And no, the search and rescue couldn't come out to him. The storm was too bad, so they found him a few days later dead. Oh, man. So stuff like that. I'm like, he was doing what he loved. He was mm-hmm. everybody loved him in the Bay Area running community. Anybody they met, super nice guy. And so during, you know, the last 200, I just said, I'm doing this for Dennis. Dennis is with me, and we're, you know, he's not here anymore to do it. And I, there's no complaining for me. I'm doing what I love, and he did what he loved up, did up, up until the end. But uh-huh. it's just still sad way to go to be by yourself. And, right. You know, so uh, from hypothermia or whatever, he passed away because nobody could get wow. to him. Wow. Yeah. So when you think of, like, the Triple Crown 200 thing that you just did or the Double John Muir or whatever <laughs> that's called, like, how do you, like, what does it mean to you? Just, you know, just showing other women. It's a lot about me inspiring other women to do things that they think they couldn't do. Mm -hmm. And I was always afraid to even be out in the wilderness. When I first started running, I was like, there's no way I would be out running on a training run, going past a certain point into the mountain. And now it's like, I'll just go wherever I want. I carry a spot device, safety, you know, out out where I live. So the spot device is like a GPS beacon. Mm -hmm. And I can hit the button if something happens to me. Something happens and it it alerts. Yeah, and it goes right to my boyfriend, directly to his Uh phone when I hit that button. And then it goes to the search and rescue as well. So that means I ain't coming out anywhere. But we're going to get a satellite phone. So that way if I'm ever out on a run... To let him know, like, okay, I'm going to be three hours behind. I got stuck in a storm over here, and I can't get over the pass uh-huh. yet. But I'm not needing a rescue, so I don't need to push that other button. But we're because he had an accident in yeah. the wilderness, and he didn't have a spot device. He broke his pelvis right. in five places seven months ago. Wow! Out on a training run, and he was taking pictures, standing on a ledge. The rock came down. He was going head first. He was able to twist his body around, Whoa. landed on his pelvis, and his phone was still up above him. He had to crawl to get his phone. He had no reception. <sighs> he had to crawl. He didn't know how far he was going to have to go. Was, at the time, he didn't know how far when she broke. But to it was find service. Place to, find. To, was, to get service, yeah. So he had to crawl one mile. It took him four hours. It was getting dark. It was in February. He had no gear to get through the mm. night. And... Had he not been calm and relaxed, like that's the kind of person he is, he could have died out there. But he was able to get reception. Luckily, you know, there was, for whatever reason, he got a little bit of reception, able to call. He called his work first because he's supposed to be flying that plane that flies people like injured. He's supposed to be the guy rescuing himself. <laughs> yes. yeah. So he called and he was like, got it. He goes, "We're I'm sending SAR where you, you know, he was able to tell him where he was at and... So the search and rescue came out to him. Then it still took him a while. It was another six miles to get him to the ambulance. Whoa. So he was that far away from the vehicle that he would have not made it. There was no, he said he couldn't have made it pretty much any farther than he did. He was just trying to remain calm. He knew he was in a bad situation, but he just had to, you know, and he was basically scooting like for one mile, four hours scooting on your butt, like trying to not do anything to one side of you. Uh So, and so they were able to take him to the hospital, x-rayed him. And then they were like, yeah, we're going to put you in our, put you in your plane that you're supposed to be flying and fly you to (laughs) Reno to have surgery. So So now he's got a spot device. Yes. we. It's like ironic, but he's the guy who should know more than anybody how important that is. But it's like, it's like a lawyer being his own advocate. Yeah. Well, and you, you know, it's like, he didn't really know. And we didn't think, you know, he had just moved to Bishop and it was like, oh yeah, we don't. And I wasn't even around. I was in, uh, I was in Texas pacing at a hundred mile race. And then I get this rambling message. Oh, I tried to base jump off of a, of a, a mountain and I fell and I broke my pelvis. That's what I got. And he, that's the message he left me. He goes, I'm at the hospital. Click. Love you. And I was like, what the fuck is this? And I like uh-huh. called him. Like, what are you talking about? Oh, he fell. He goes, and he had no, hardly any reception back on his phone. He goes, I'm having surgery. And I'm like, wait, wait, what's happening? What's happening? Wow. But he's just that kind of guy. Like, don't worry about it. I'm cool. You know? Wow. So he's still making yeah, it's a comeback. Dangerous. It's yeah. super dangerous. Do you, have you, are you familiar with what's been going on at Malibu Creek here? Uh-uh. There's like a there was there was a murder and there's been a bunch of break-ins around here and they've just apprehended a guy who they're calling the 
the Malibu State Park Survivalist or something like that. Whoa, no, um, I haven't heard like of that. But there's like a guy who's been living out like the big, I don't you, you've probably yes, run I run Creek, there, right? Yeah, yeah, I was just running there this morning. That's the local, that's where I go. Yeah. Um, there was like a dad and his child who were camping in there like, I don't know, eight or nine months ago who got shot point blank. <sighs> and there's been a couple other weird things that have happened around here, like like a dead body discovered by the Hindu temple. And they don't know if these things are related. Yeah. And then a bunch of break-ins around here where uh, nothing's stolen, but they can tell, oh, somebody, you know, forced forced entry, but the food, like they've eaten all the food. And they're oh, they're taking, taking food, food out of it. Yeah. yeah. So it's like, oh, somebody's living in the woods, right? Yeah. So they just, there's been like this manhunt, like just like two weeks ago, there were like 12 cop cars and like those armored tank, like wow. military LAPD vehicles and the helicopters. And they found this guy. I don't know that they've been able to legitimate, like Pinpoint be able to prove to that yeah. he's the guy behind all of this, but some guy's been living back out in there. I mean, there's so much land. There's got to be people like that all over the place. Like and all these parts Bishop, where you are. Like, yeah, yeah, there's like... These people off the grid that yeah, are... That they are, could do yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they can't go way up in the mountains in the winter because it's snowing, uh-huh. but they can come in around town yeah. and there's so many... Uh, off-road vehicle trails in Bishop. Like, I can run for days. I mean, we're working on making maybe a 200-mile loop out there, too. Oh, really? Like making your own trail? <laughs> no. I'm talking the race director oh, trying to do a race right, out there. Good. What would you call it? Bishop the Truman? 200. Oh, you no, you got to name it after Truman, I think. <laughs> no, <Nope>, Bishop <laughs> 200. Um, well, I love the fact that, that you are this, like, strong, uh, you know, presence and uh, and source of strength for so many women. You know, I think it's super important. And your story is like crazy cinematic. It's like, oh, you're working in a beauty parlor and you're not an athlete and you got all these tattoos and crazy hair and you're goth, never had done anything. And now you're like, you just crush it, you know, and you continue to crush it and you show up and you show up and you show up. And it's just, I think it's the, I think what speaks to me more than anything is like the spirit in which you do it. Like you're just you're full of like good energy and happiness. Yeah, and I, I think that's really so inspiring. Long. Yeah. And I look back though and people are like, would you change anything? And I said, nope, because I wouldn't be who I am today. Yeah. Had, and had I not had to go through any of those experiences. The darkness is get the teacher. Drug, yeah. It's like, I wouldn't be sitting right here in front of you mm-hmm. had I not been all of those things. Yeah. So when people, I'm sure people email you or get in touch with you and say, I'm, I can't get off drugs or I'm trying to get all sober, or you're inspiring me. Like, what do, you, what do you usually try to share with those people? You know, of course, try to tell them, go to AA yeah, or I NA know. right off the bat that I'm not yeah. a therapist. But uh-huh. I just, you know, I just say, if you just, you know, believe in yourself and start exercising, start eating right, you, you can do it, you know, and it's like, Sure enough, months later, uh, people will message me back and say, thank you for just even saying anything to me because I didn't think you were going to message me back. Mm -hmm. And I get that all the time. I'm like, why wouldn't I message you back? I mean, you get a lot of emails. I get a lot of emails, but I always try to at least give them a sentence on a a post because that one person, you could be changing their life. And Mm -hmm. I learned that a long time ago that I'm like, I need to, and especially those ones where you're like, ooh. There's, there's, you know, reaching out to me and I need to say something because who knows who they're not reaching yeah. out to. And I and, find often that it's, it's not necessarily about the information. It's like, yeah, duh. Like you need to go to an AA meeting exactly. or you need to re- raise your hand and ask for help or you need to see a shrink or you need to like, I think most people already know that. Yeah. But it's, they want, they're like, they're, they are raising their hand to you. For sure. And it's the connection, it's the sense that they're being heard and they're being recognized, I think that is the most important thing. I, I agree with you, yeah. for sure. And that, I think, can be transformative for people. For sure. Um, I think this is a really boring question, but I'm going to get killed <laughs> if I don't ask it, <laughs> which <know>. is, <laughs> like, take me through a day in food. Like, wh- how, do you, how do you do all this stuff and do it on a vegan diet? What are you eating? What are you eating? typical day what are you eating when you're tra- you know what are you eating what do you bring with you when you're training and like how do you fuel on these races so usually like morning it's either like i usually do um like a smoothie or do some yogurt with pinoli on it and uh-huh. just like real Back simple to the born to run thing yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so explain you, what that is for people that don't know so it's uh what is it it's uh, what they 
eat the tarahumara eat in uh, the Copper Canyon in Mexico. And so it's just a grain that they use that has all this protein and it's supposed to have all these vitamins in it. And it tastes actually good. And I like adding it to my yogurt just to add some more flavor mm-hmm. and maybe a little protein. And usually that's all I have in the morning. And a lot of times I don't even eat before I run in the morning if I'm just going out for a short run until I come back like at 11. I'm not mm-hmm. a big breakfast person. And then I'll have like for lunch, I'll just take like a Beyond Meat burger patty and a bowl of fruit and just eat the patty by itself and then some fruit. And then for dinner is my main meal. So I just do like a big salad with a hodgepodge of everything in it. Mm -hmm. You know, some, you know, Beyond Meat burger, you know, I use like sriracha, vegan mayo, you like Uh spicy stuff, you know, and just every vegetable. And I do a lot of cauliflower rice. I like that. Yeah. That's one of my favorite things. So somebody's my, my listening to this is, not is that like, exciting. all right, I know it's basic. That's yeah. why it's like, this is kind of a boring question. I, yeah. I, I suspected that your answer would be something <laughs> like that. But I think a lot of people would be surprised. They're like, well, how is that? That doesn't seem like very much. Like, how is that powering this person through 120 miles of running every week? It does. If you're eating it, well, I mean, I eat other stuff. Like when I'm really hungry, you know, I'll add more almond butter into like a smoothie and just more calories. Mm-hmm. But I'm getting clearly enough because I'm not, you know, if I start feeling like I'm losing weight, then I add, start adding more calories. But I'm just not a huge, like, eating tons of food all the time. And from when I'm out running, I always bring stuff. So what usually are you bringing almond, when you're, what are you? almond butter packets, like packets of almond butter. And this one company I just found makes, like, a bigger one. So it's, like, five servings. So I can use that. What and company is that? It's uh, Trail Butter. And they only have one vegan formula. So I'm going to try to email them and say, can we make the coffee one with vegan for uh-huh. the 200s? <laughs> So I used that actually during the 200 mile race and it was great because in between those aid stations, when I had like five hours to go, that big thing powered me. And Muir Energy, which is a great company, they're local here and they have like four to five ingredients. And so it's thicker than a regular gel and it's almost like a consistency of an almond butter Mm -hmm. and they're like about 180 calories per little packet of gel. So I use that in baby food packets and that's Mm -hmm. pretty much what I eat. And then even in these 200 mile races in between, that's all I'm eating. But at the race aid stations, I sit down and they make, that's one thing unique about between a hundred and a 200 and a hundred mile race. I'm not eating that much. You have to sit down because you got to go 20 miles again. So they have a full vegan gluten-free selection there for really? you. Really? Yeah, they have the bin, wow. the gluten-free vegan bin. And there's a lot of people. There's so you know, many gluten-free vegans. Even my <laughs> one of my pacers is not even a vegan, but he was trying to eat more vegan when he uh-huh. was out there with us, and he was eating the gluten-free, and he goes, this stuff's good. So they whip up you a patty right there. You have to wait for, you know, because they're making it to order because, you know, not coming in like in a 100-mile race, a bunch of right. people, you got to leave food out. So they cook it up, you sit there, and they even had gluten-free vegan bread. I was like, what? <laughs> you know, uh-huh. so I would sit down and eat tons, of, and people are like, "Wow, how can you eat that much?" So I'd have lentil soup, then I would have the patty, then I would have the bread, and then I would have hash browns, mm. <laughs> and then I would go again. Right. So that was a lot of fuel, and then in between, I would do the almond butter and the Muir Energy and the baby foods. Do you do real foods too, like dates and bananas? Oh yeah, yeah. And, dates. And I don't do a lot of bananas. I lo- and... Yeah, if they have sweet potatoes out there, but dates, I carry those all the time. Yeah. Like dates are like one of my favorite things yeah. for training because bars, you know, it's like they have so many different things. I mean, they even have raw foods bars, but I'd rather just have dates for the sweetness and the carbohydrates. They're like the per- they're nature's gel. They are. When I did the Marathon de Saab in Morocco many years ago, the stage race, mm-hmm. I noticed like the guys that were winning these races, I'm like, how do they, their packs look so small. It's because they look at your calorie content and you have to have a certain amount a day. They just had bags of dates and that was the amount of calories you know, for the entire right. race, because it's three dates is like 120 calories. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, shit, that's how they got away with it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like taking wrappers off my bars to make it lighter in the bag and, you know, whatever else. Have you, you just did that race once? Yeah. You did that a long time ago. I'd like to do it again, but it's just yeah. so crazy now. That's a crazy race with I like know. a thousand people and yeah, just yeah, like yeah. Pff, yeah. exploded. Um, I just had Fiona Oaks on. Who, yeah, they just she's made really this documentary cool. about. She's her amazing. She's so funny. <laughs> I know. She's very funny. I'm like, what? She's like How really serious, know? but like really funny in a self-deprecating yeah, way. You're like, you you're know? amazing, but she's like, oh no, I don't like running. And I'm she's like, like, I'm like the I don't like it. I love I'm not very I'm good at it. I'm a shit runner. <laughs> so <laughs> like, it's like, how? <laughs> how could you? Yeah, she's. I want to see her documentary. Yeah, you should watch it. It's good. She's really. She's a cool lady. Um. I think it's worth noting also, like just on the calorie thing and like how you eat every day, that 
you've been doing this so long when when you go out on your daily 20 mile run or whatever it is that you're doing that's just not that ta- it's it, it can't be that taxing like people think oh my god 20 miles like i'd be in bed for a week after that no, i'm or, not you know, running it's like, like it's, an eight minute mile yeah it's and, like, and like yeah. taking pictures and selfies and making videos uh-huh. <laughs> Who is, do you do, uh, who's do taking all these pictures? Me. So how are you doing that when you're Self-timer. like facing, oh, you do, okay. And I have a little tripod you're I selfie. carry. Oh, you do? <laughs> <laughs> and so now my video I ones, know. I have a little button, so I set it up and then ah, got to do the dance videos. The tricks so of the trade. I, yeah, yeah. I'm good. I know people are like, who follows you? Truman can't be doing I know, because I was like, somebody's taking photos, because their photos are always are really like, great. You don't run by yourself. I'm like, of course I do. This and it's is just all iPhone me. or like iPhone. cell phone? Mm-hmm. iPhone. All right, there I you know. go. No excuses. Would have known. <laughs> and that makes people smile too, because they're like, oh, we look forward to seeing these funny videos that you do, yeah. like your music videos. And it just gets people out the door because they're like, oh, shit, they're like she's having fun. Okay, we're going to go run today. You right. Know. It makes it less intimidating. Yeah. You know, you're like, I'm going to run this, and it's yeah. super scary. You're like, <laughs> I just no, have fun. I'm I just out with have fun. Truman, and he's wearing ski, ski goggles. <laughs> and <laughs> an outfit. Like, what is happening here? <laughs> it looks like, I mean, sometimes it looks like. For um, characters. <laughs> No, it looks like like uh, you're you're like. Are you on the set of Mad Max? Like it's there's something <laughs> post apocalyptic about the whole thing. You Poor know? Truman. I know. So what are you now? You've done these two, these three two hundreds. Like what? What's next? Do you just go right into the next race or? Yeah, I had in between eleven day break for my next hundred mile. Eleven days. And I yeah. And I'm like how luxurious I'm doing it, you know. But I'm going for my tenth at Havelina 100. And last year I had did Moab 240 because that was the first year they had it. And eleven days later did the hundred mile, and I'm uh-huh. like never again, never again. And then I'm like, oh crap, I have to because I'm going for number ten now. So yeah. And that's, yeah. So that's coming up when it's uh, next Friday or oh, Saturday. Wow. Uh huh. But I love that race because I wear a costume every year. It's always right before Halloween. Yeah. It's like a big party. If I was ever to suggest somebody to do their first 100 that wanted to be kind of low-key about it, it's loop. It's 20-mile loops. Do Havelina. It's like a party. Yeah. And in now Ari- you it's don't in feel. the Arizona desert. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. It's hot. It's going to be warm probably. Yeah, but I've yeah. been looking at the temperature. It doesn't look much over 80. So keeping my fingers crossed. What's the costume nature. you're going to wear? I'm going to be... Uh, uh, what is what is the name? Oh my God! Uh, the from Alice in Wonderland, uh, the the rabbit. What is his name? I'm blanking right now. I know, me too. And I have the That's costume scene good. right huh, yeah. at home. Well, I was going to be her, and then I was like, no, I got to be the the white rat, Mad the Hatter. White, Thank you, Mad, Mad Hatter. Hatter. Yes, That's of what course. <laughs> My daughter was just the Mad Hatter in a I play, and I can't. Well, I have had so many costumes yeah. every year. I'm something. So yeah, I got this like dialed in costume. We're I'm both working in our on 50s. making my... It's like it's okay. We can have a brain. <laughs> I know we can have Go a ahead. brain. I ran 240 miles. <laughs> yeah, the other come day. on, come on, my brain's dead. <laughs> so yeah, and I just have to finish making my little hat, and I'm all set. The uh-huh. costume's ready to roll. Like the full black top hat with the playing no, cards I made a small in it. Or... One. Yeah, so I'm going right. to do that, and I have to make like a little watch on there, and I have the little rabbit ears on there and I'm carrying a little rabbit I always carry like a prop so I'll pin it to the back of my pack the white rabbit (laughs) it's just getting more surreal yeah you'll see the costume you'll Um, love it (laughs) all right we got to wind this down but uh I want to end this with some some inspiration for people that that are feeling stuck in their life or feeling like um maybe that ship has sailed you know i think it's so inspiring what you do and and the way that you do it it just makes like i said it makes people feel comfortable taking a leap of faith or getting outside their comfort zone um because you make it fun and you make it accessible so if somebody's sitting on the couch or they're rubber banding in and out of whatever lifestyle habit they're trying to adopt like how can how can we get people to understand that the things that you do are not necessarily unique to you, but available to everybody. They got to get out and just find their passion and just have fun. Don't, don't go into it trying to be so serious. Maybe if you want to start running or you want to get outdoors to make yourself feel better, just start by hiking. Just get out and breathe the air. Go out for a walk and look at the flowers, look at the plants, look at the trees. I mean, that to me, just getting out is the first step. You don't have to become a runner or do 100 miles or do whatever, but get out and then see what the world has to offer and change, of course, change the way you eat. Eating healthy definitely Mm -hmm. will help your mindset too. And and I think that's a big part of 
when I got into recovery that it did help me was eating healthy, Mm -hmm. you know, not eating the junk and the toxic stuff and just getting rid of toxicity in my life. So just get out and enjoy it and just find your passion. These things are cumulative. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not, they're not unrelated to each other. You start taking care of yourself in one way and then you're more, more encouraged to take care of yourself in other ways. And when I look at your story and your life and your trajectory, I mean, it's so dramatic and crazy that you (laughs) went from this place of where you were to what you're doing now and you're just continuing to crush it you know it's just it's so awesome i was meant to be on this planet for a reason and to inspire others i always say you know it's like i you know tried to commit suicide and it's like it didn't happen because i'm supposed to be here so Mm -hmm. well i'm glad you are thank you cool so uh the book is called reborn Reborn on on the the run Run. Mm -hmm. um are you out like doing talks so like is there a way for people to if they want to come and Yeah, so um, they can actually, if they want to even get a copy, they can get it on Amazon, or Mm -hmm. they can actually email me. um, My website's almost finished, but they can email me at dirtdiva333 at gmail.com if they want an autographed copy, and I can send that out to them, and they can get it through that way. Uh But my website will be up, and they'll be able to order it through there. You get your website done when your book comes out. I, it's <laughs> you're too busy running to yeah. Well, 600, I had to have my boyfriend do it. I'm like trying to find somebody to do it <laughs> yeah. for me, and he came up with this great well, one. Well, he had and, to base jump off a rock. Yeah, and, exactly. You know, so, that's so he just did it while I was out running the 240. He's like finally had time to sit down because he's working uh-huh. two jobs and he's a busy body guy right. and running and so. But yeah, so it's finally getting done. But I'll be um, my next book signing is in December. First at uh, Running Skirts in San Diego, and I'll be at Havelina doing a book signing. Right. They'll be selling my book there at the 100 cool. Miler next week. So. Awesome. And uh, if people want to connect with you online, you're at Dirt Diva 3333. Three, three, three. Three. So yep. how many threes? Three threes. <laughs> three, three. What's the deal with that? I'm just obsessed with the number three. And three threes is like way more luckier. Like it's uh-huh. a better number and it's like a positive number. If you look up 333, three, three, it's a very like the angels and positive things are always around you when you have that number. And I see that when I look at a, my watch or my phone, f- a few times a week I see 333 three, three, or I'll see a car go by or... I'll see those numbers. Yeah. <laughs> Looking at his watch. <laughs> it's not 333. What time yeah. is it right now? Yeah. Wouldn't it be, oh my God, you know what? It's like five of three right now. If it was 333 right now, I would. I, I might I see that out. a lot. Do you? So, but yeah, I'm just obsessed with that number. Thing. Uh-huh. And then Instagram. Same. Oh, Instagram is Dirt Diva 333 and Twitter is Dirt Diva 33. 33, I think. That for some reason, I couldn't get couldn't the 33. Three. And then on, Facebook, I have an that. athlete page because my regular page is full, which is like whatever. Mm-hmm. So I have an athlete page. And Truman has a page, too. Truman does. Does Truman have his own Instagram? He doesn't because I just keep us together. It's too complicated. Right. His little paws can't really use the phone that well. So. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> We just let him have a Facebook. <laughs> a- he has a Facebook athlete page. Uh-huh. So. Truman has a lot of personality. I'm telling you, if I you've know. never gotten a dose of Truman, you're in for a treat. Most everybody has yeah. seen him around, and they cool. like their selfies. Like my poor crew guy, he was like at one of the aid stations, and all you see is these pictures of an, his arm and Truman. Like everybody's taking pictures of Truman, uh-huh. and he goes, "My arm got really popular. <laughs> my arm." Oh my god. <laughs> yeah. Um, Awesome. Well, you're super inspiring. I just want to recognize you uh, for all the amazing work that you're doing. Thank you. It's really cool to follow your your path and all your racing and all the fun stuff that you do and the spirit in which you do it. And uh, I just want you to keep doing it. Thank you. I will. I'll keep going. I appreciate you coming by and talking to me today. I appreciate it too. Thank you for having me. So come back anytime. I will. And I'll bring Truman. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I have to bring Truman. Truman can do an interview. Truman would be great. (laughs) Especially on the video. Yeah. All right, Katra, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, peace. Awesome. Blitz.